Hey guys, it's Keith Foskey. On last Saturday, July 27th, 2024, I was invited onto the Standing for Truth YouTube channel to debate Lucas Curcio on the subject of the millennium. And I want to thank Donnie Bedensky for having me on the program and for being a great host and moderator of that debate. Well, I'm going to be sharing that debate now on my channel. And I'd like to ask you all how you think it goes. I'd love to hear your comments as you listen, and I encourage you to listen intently to both sides. I know many Christians are divided over the subject of the millennium. Lucas takes a premillennial position, and as many of you know, I take the amillennial position. So we're debating the subject of whether or not Revelation 19 and 20 are to be understood chronologically. Lucas says yes, I say no. But what say you? Please listen to the debate and leave a comment below. Before I start the debate, I just want to remind you of a few things. This podcast is a ministry of Sovereign Grace Family Church. So if you're in the Jacksonville area, come visit us at Sovereign Grace Family Church. You can find us at sgfcjax.org. We're also a partner with tinybibles.com. If you want to get the smallest Bible that you can possibly get on the market in print today, go to tinybibles.com and use my name, Keith, as a promo code, and you will get a percentage off. Don't forget also, if you want to reach out to me, you can send me a message simply by going to keithfosky.com. There's a contact form right on the front page. The email comes directly to me. I look forward to hearing from you if you have a question or an idea for an upcoming show. All right, again, thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. And here comes the debate. May God bless you. All right. Welcome, everybody, to Standing for Truth. My name is Donnie Bedinsky, and I am your host and moderator for tonight's much-anticipated debate on the millennium. And I am thrilled to have Keith Foskey and Lucas Curcio here to debate this topic. This afternoon's resolution is this. Is Revelation 19 to 20 chronological? Lucas takes the affirmative, and Keith Foskey takes the negative. And again, this is the great millennium debate, and I am pumped for this. Gentlemen, what I'd like to do before we get into our opening statements is firstly, thank you both for giving us your time for this epic exchange, for sure, and break the ice, get acquainted a little bit, get to know you guys. And so, uh, Keith, let's start with you, as this is your first time here on the Standing for Truth debate platform. And if I'm not mistaken, many call you the king of all millennialism. So firstly, is that true? Are the rumors true? And secondly, my brother, tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do at your ministry. Yes, I am uh, Keith Foskey. I am the king of the amillennialists. That is a joke that was started by Eschatology Matters, and it's just taken off and kind of gotten a life of its own. I do a lot of humor online. I do stand-up comedy uh, and Christian comedy and uh, things like that. So it's just part of the humor uh, not to be taken too seriously. But, uh, but I am an amillennialist, and so that's the position I'm going to be standing for today. I also pastor Sovereign Grace Family Church in Jacksonville, Florida, where I have served for the last 18 years. Awesome. Well, I appreciate that introduction. I also appreciate the, the humor. So laughter is the best medicine. And one of the first ways I found you was through your, uh, your funny shorts. And then I found your podcast, and people can find that here. So, Keith, uh, we've got your YouTube channel and uh, a podcast where people can check you out and find more from you if they like what they're hearing. And so, again, Keith, thank you for the intro. Lucas, great to have you back. Not your first time here on the Standing for Truth debate platform. So I guess you're going to have to be the king of premillennialism then. Prince. So we got <laughs> the king of premill clashing with the king of all Clash of the Titans tonight is what it is. So, Lucas... How are you doing, brother? And tell us a little bit about yourself and your channel. Great, great. Well, um, I classify myself as a prince of pre-mail, oh, yeah. but, but unlike uh, Keith, I'm self-ordained, so I did not get voted in, so don't accept that <laughs> title. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so uh, my name is Lucas Curcio. I live in northern New Jersey. It's fantastic to be here, and I'm honored to be here. I am a Christian, and theologically, I call myself a Methodist. And uh, you know, in, in uh, relation to this debate, I am a pre-millennialist. I am married and me and my wife, we have a beautiful daughter. So God has blessed us with that. I have my master's of arts in biblical exposition from Liberty University. And I am the uh, founder of Method Ministries. I like to say, you know, say that term, it sounds fun. 
Uh, Method Ministry is just a online ministry where we talk about topics that are related to like uh, you know theology, cur- uh, current issues that are going on both politically as well. And it's just a name and a title to get the truth of the scriptures out there. So that's a little bit about me. And again, you know, I'm grateful to be here. Very good. It's a privilege to have you both. It really is an honor to be hosting this debate between you two true professionals. Again, this is the Great Millennium Debate. It is a Saturday afternoon showdown. So I'm excited for this. For those who want to see more from Lucas Curcio here, you can find a link to his YouTube channel in the live chat and also in the description box. And so, gentlemen, appreciate uh, the introductions from the both of you. Thank you so much. And okay, for the audience sake, let's go through today's format. And so, again, the debate resolution is, is Revelation 19 to 20 chronological? Luke is taking the affirmative, so he'll be kicking us off with a 20-minute opening statement. So 20-minute openings from both our guests. We're going to have a comprehensive one today, followed by a 10-minute uninterrupted rebuttal. Then we're going to get into everybody's favorite part of these debates, the cross-exam. So we got a lot of time to uh, discuss the topic in cross-examination, 50 minutes in total. That's 25 minutes each. Then we'll have a concluding statement where for our concluding statement, Keith will start and then Lucas will get the last word as he is the affirmative. And then this is where we get you guys in the audience involved. We'll have a roughly 25 to 30 minute audience Q&A. So please, if you have a question on tonight's topic, do your best to let me know who the question is for, Lucas or Keith. And also tag me at Donnie or at Standing for Truth. And that way I won't miss your question. Okay, gentlemen, let's jump into our first opening statement. And so, Lucas, please, whenever you're ready, just let me know and we'll get your timer going. Okay. Well, I just want to say it's a true honor to be here with Brother Keith. I'm really looking forward to this. And thank you to Donnie for moderating and hosting us as well. It's great to be back. And I want to dedicate this uh, opening statement to all my pre-mill brothers and you know to keep with with the, the humor of this debate it's time to end the spiritual reign of the king of our mills and take that crown to god be the glory and again the affirmative i defend tonight revelation 19 and 20 are chronological requires the nature of this debate to be exegetical i mention this because there was much attempt by my amil brothers to interpret these two chapters by telescoping for the portions of scripture They'll use verses like Psalms 50.10, the cattle on a thousand hills are gods, and claim because a thousand here isn't literal, neither is Revelation. Or Matthew 12, where Jesus speaks of binding Satan to say this is the same binding in Revelation 20, which proves that Revelation isn't literal. But this is equivalent to interpreting Romans 9 with John 3.16. Such attempts don't reflect proper exegesis because they're two different contexts. Thus, both Keith and I must engage with what John taught in his original intended meaning and not venture outside these chapters. My position is that if you do this, you'll walk away with Revelation 19 and 20 being chronological and not recapitulatory, thus proving premillennialism. Recapitulation means to go back to a time prior. So it's like watching a movie and at some point there's a scene that takes you back to a time prior to the present. Amil's claim Revelation 20 verse 1 does this when it says, then I saw, as in John is seeing a vision of a time prior to the second coming of chapter 19. But if this single text of scripture doesn't do this, then amillennialism is wrong. Amillennial scholar Anthony Hokama admits this and says that that if these chapters are chronological, we are then virtually compelled to believe that the thousand year reign depicted in Revelation 20 must come after the return of Christ in chapter 19. Let me demonstrate that you're compelled to believe premillennialism by defending the thesis, the textual evidence of Revelation 19 and 20 favors chronology. And the first piece of evidence that the ands of chapter 19 and 20 have a chronological pattern. We see this in verse 20, and the beast was seized and with him the false prophet, chronological sequence. Verse 21, and the rest were killed with the sword, which came from the mouth of him who sat on the horse, chronological sequence. And all the birds were filled with their flesh, chronological sequence. Now, you can get technical and say that and doesn't always mean historical sequence, but can be used as a visionary linking device. And this is where I'll engage with respected 
scholar G.K. Beale, who offers two powerful arguments for the amillennial view. Argument number one of Dr. Beale. He writes in his famous commentary on Revelation, only three out of 35 occurrences of and in 19 clearly indicate sequence in historical time, while the remainder serve as visionary linking devices. So I agree with Dr. Beale that John does use and as a linking device at times rather than a sequential device. John does this in verse 19, and I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies assembled to make war against him who sat on a horse and against his army. The ands here are used to link this event to Christ's second coming and not for chronological sequence. But there's a difference between and being used to link events versus and being used to recapitulate events. And this is where Dr. Beale gets problematic. He goes on to admit that the three ands in verses 20 and 21 are historically sequential. He even grants that perhaps verse 14 and indicates a sequence in historical time. So he admits that all three ands in verses 20 and 21 are chronological. But then when it comes to chapter 20, verse 1, claims his pattern is broken by saying it's recapitulated. And here's where it gets even more problematic. Buell further admits that the majority of ands in chapter 20 are historically sequential. He writes, the majority of the ands in chapter 20 do refer to historical sequence. Dr. Beale acknowledges that there's a pattern of ands that are chronological. But Dr. Beale is a smart man and argues for more than just one word for the amill position. And this leads us into argument number two of Dr. Beale. He states that the word and in reference to an angel coming down out of heaven is always recapitulatory. He writes, where and I saw occurs in Revelation, followed by reference to an angel coming down out of heaven, it always introduces a vision either reverting to a time before the preceding section. So Dr. Beale's argument is that recapitulation is found in a phrase, and I saw an angel coming down, rather than a single word, and. This is Beale's strongest argument, and I pay my respects to him for engaging with the text. Nevertheless, to solidify this argument, this exegesis must be consistent with the narrative of the story and the whole of chapter 20. Dr. Bill even admits this and says that the word and cannot solve the problem one way or another. Other contextual evidence must be considered. In other words, even Dr. Beale admits that your interpretation of Revelation 20 must also account for more than just verse 1. We need to look at all the textual evidence. And if we do that, we find that John's use of the phrase, and I saw another angel coming down out of heaven, all the data favors chronology and not recapitulation. And on this note, let me say that I am not against recapitulation. I agree that Revelation does recapitulate at times, such as it does in chapter 12. But for a text to recapitulate, we must have textual evidence. In other words, I disagree with Dr. Beale who says that recapitulation is found in a phrase, and I saw another angel coming down in heaven. Rather, recapitulation is not attached to a phrase, but rather to the narrative. And we can easily see this in chapter 12, where we're introduced by a new vision from the previous chapter. Revelation 11 ends with Christ's second coming, and then chapter 12 changes that narrative to John seeing a woman who gives birth to Jesus, and Satan attempting to destroy him and his followers. Clearly, chapter 12 takes us back to the first coming of Christ, but it does so without the phrase, and I saw another angel. Yet in Revelation 20, we don't have a narrative change of a prior event, but a continuation of the battle from chapter 19. So if we're to assume that chapters 19 and 20 are chronological, we would predict that after the beast and false prophet are defeated, Satan would be the next one on the list to go. By the way, this is how science works. It makes a set of assumptions and then based upon that makes predictions to test its validity. If we make an assumption that chapters 19 and 20 are chronological and predict that right after the beasts and false prophet are defeated as Satan is, we can test this and see this is exactly what we find. In verses 20 and 21 of chapter 19, Christ defeats the Antichrist and false prophet, and then Satan in the next chapter. It's important to mention this because there's an unholy trinity in Revelation. You have the Antichrist, the false prophet, and Satan. So if there's no defeat of Satan in chapter 19, then Satan isn't defeated. But if we keep reading, we find the narrative continued, and just one verse after Christ defeats the beast and false prophet, he defeats Satan. So there's a single story arc being told. Now, in addition to this, another piece of evidence is chapter 20, verse 10. Here, John says that after Satan is released, after the millennial, he makes another failed attempt to destroy God's people. Then he is thrown into the lake of fire, and John then mentions that it's the same place where the beast and false prophet are, past tense. John speaks of the beast and false prophet's place in the lake of fire as having already happened that is prior to Satan's casting into the lake of fire, which means that he has a narrative in mind from chapter 19 in the past tense, 
and Satan's arrival is a thousand years after theirs chronologically. Now, some all mills are aware of this problem and in response point out that in the Greek, there is no verb are, as some translations have it, as the devil who deceived them was thrown to the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and false prophet are. In the Greek, it just reads that Satan is thrown into the lake of fire, where the beast and false prophet. But let me point out two things. One, the majority of Greek scholars recognize this as being in the past tense. The NASB, LSB, ESV, KJV, NKJV, CSB, Young's Little Translation, even the NIV all translate this. The list goes on and on as being in the past tense. Two, there doesn't need to be a verb are. The word where presupposes that the subject is there prior to that person's arrival. For example, if I told you that I was going to eat at a restaurant, where my brother is, you'd assume that my brother is there before me. In the same way, John is saying that Satan is thrown into the same place where the beast and false prophet are before Satan arrives. This means there's chronology. The beast and false prophet were thrown into the lake of fire first, past tense, then Satan is thrown in after them. The only thing that accounts for Satan's later arrival is a thousand year gap, which demands we read these two chapters chronologically, not recapitulatory. Another piece of evidence for chronology is that there's a total absence of Christ's second coming in chapter 20. So the Amil agrees with Premill that chapter 19 is Christ's second coming, but then states that chapter 20 recapitulates and covers the time between Christ's first and second coming. Okay, so where in chapter 20 is the second coming of Christ? I would reference Dr. Beale on this, but he's completely silent and it doesn't make any mention of any second coming in chapter 20. So you know, let's, uh, let's assume that chapter 20 recapitulates. We would predict that Revelation 20 mentions Christ's second coming. Yet we don't find it here. It's completely missing. Some post mills have attempted to answer this and say that the fire in verse 9, which comes out out of, out of heaven to destroy Satan's army, is Christ's return. But if this is actually true, which is a huge stretch, then at best this is extremely vague and hardly believable. The textual evidence of chapter 20 is clear. There is no second coming mentioned. Because John already mentioned in chapter 19, which means that chapters 20, I'm sorry, that means that chapters 19 and 20 are chronological. Other textual evidence in favor of chronology. The binding of Satan in chapter 20 hasn't happened yet. Dr. Beale says that Satan's binding is the devil will not be able to stop the preaching of the gospel or his expanding reception during most of the church, uh, most of the age preceding Christ's return. Or another on mill view interprets the binding as Kim Riddlebarger says. Binding of Satan means is that after the coming of a long-expected Messiah, Satan lost certain authority that he possessed prior to the life, death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of the Savior. Neither view works with the text. First, the binding of Satan is not a probation, but an incarceration. So uh, incarceration means being confined to a prison cell rather than having some sort of access to roam around. And we see this because Satan is not just bound with a chain. So John isn't saying that Satan is on probation with an ankle bracelet attached to him. John says in verse 3, the angel threw him to the abyss, shut and sealed it over him. It's a total removal of Satan from the earth. Notice too, it says he's in the abyss. So if we compare this to chapter 9, it talks about an angel opening the bottomless pit, and then out of this pit come demonic beings who enter earth. The bottomless pit is in the abyss because Revelation 9, 11 calls it that. This means in Revelation, the abyss is not on earth because the demons come out of the abyss onto the earth. Thus, Satan is chained, thrown into the abyss, then that door is shut and sealed, not having any access to the earth, and he's clearly not in probation. Second, Amiel's interpret this binding of Satan taking, or I'm sorry, uh, this binding of Satan as taking place at Christ's first coming. But there's a major problem with this because John says after the thousand years, Satan is released. So here's the problem. If Christ's work on the cross is a permanent victory, in what sense is Satan released from Christ's victory at the cross after a thousand years? So what this means is that the binding of Satan here is not referring to Christ's redemptive work on the cross that frees us from Satan's kingdom and brings us into his. So while I do agree that Christ did bind Satan at the cross, but that binding was redemptive. The binding of Satan in chapter 20 is a political binding, as John says, so he won't deceive the nations, not a redemptive binding. And we can't conflate the two. There are two different contexts. Last, Revelation 20, verse 4, is the bodily resurrection, which happens after Christ returns, proving it follows chapter 19. In chapter 20, verse 4, John says that the martyred souls came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. 
Some Amels interpret the phrase came to life as regeneration, but the subjects are already Christians, which means they are already born again, which means they're already regenerated, which proves that John isn't referring to regeneration because otherwise John would be saying those born again are born again. It would be a total redundancy. Other Amels claim the resurrection refers to the intermediate state of saints entering heaven when they die. Now, while there are times in the Bible that do refer to a spiritual resurrection of saints when they first come to faith, yet nowhere in the Bible does it describe saints entering heaven as a spiritual resurrection. So again, if these saints are already born again and they already died, the only resurrection that happens after death is a bodily resurrection. Furthermore, the most important fact of this resurrection here is verse 5, where John says, the rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were completed. This verse proves without a shadow of a doubt that the resurrection of the saints here is bodily. As a sentence example, this is like saying, I was flu vaccinated yesterday, but the rest of my family did not get flu vaccinated until a week later. Regardless of the time, both me and my family were flu vaccinated. So the phrase did not get flu vaccinated until a week later communicates in the sentence that they'll receive the same type of vaccination only later than me, rather than a different type of vaccination. And I mentioned this, and this is very important because the Amil wants you to believe that the resurrection of the saints is spiritual, a different type, while the, res while the resurrection of the dead is physical, a different type. But John's phrase did not come to life is a negative statement intended to communicate that the same resurrection that happens to the saints is the same resurrection that happens to the dead, with the difference being only at a later time. So whether the Amil interprets the resurrection of the saints as regeneration or the intermediate state is really irrelevant and a moot point, because clearly John is not saying the rest of the dead did not become regenerated or entered heaven until a thousand years were completed. Since both groups are experiencing the same type of resurrection, the only interpretation that works is the bodily resurrection. But the Amils insist that the resurrection of the dead in verse 5 is bodily, while claiming the saints are spiritual. But let's compare John's phrase, came to life with Revelation 2, verse 8. There Jesus says to himself, the first and the last who was dead and has come to life. Both in chapter 20 and chapter 2, verse 8, it's the same exact phrase, come to life. So just like Christ, after Jesus died, the resurrection he had was bodily. So too, when believers die, their resurrection after death is bodily, not spiritually. So again, the Bible never refers to saints dying and entering heaven as a spiritual resurrection. The only resurrection that Christians experience after they die is a bodily resurrection, the same one that our Lord had and that we share in. And John teaches in Revelation 20 that after Jesus comes, the saints will rise bodily and reign with Christ for a thousand years, while after the millennial, the dead will be raised to damnation. Thus, when we look at all the evidence, it favors not recapitulation, but chronology, which means that these two chapters teach premillennialism. Thank you, and that concludes my opening statement. Lucas, thank you very much for that 20-minute opening statement. We're now going to hand it over to Keith Foskey for his 20-minute opening statement. So I will reset the timer. And Keith, whenever you're ready, let me know. The floor is yours. Yeah, I'm good. Well, first, I want to thank Donnie for putting this debate together and for Lucas agreeing to be my interlocutor. And for both of you for being willing to be seen with me in public. The book of Revelation is by far the most enigmatic of all the New Testament writings and this is proven by how many variations of theology have arisen based on it. The most perplexing portion has to be chapter 20, as it too has spawned entire systems of theology, to the point that some who hold various positions on this chapter would even anathematize those with differences, something I find very troubling. If we cannot have at least some humility to our approach of Revelation 20, I believe we ourselves, we find ourselves as arrogant as the Pharisees and the Sadducees who could not see Jesus for who he was, because they were so committed to their traditions, and even when the truth was standing in their midst, he was unrecognizable. They were convinced that Jesus has to fulfill certain prophecies according to their understanding, and because he didn't, they rejected him. I pray that we would never be so foolish. 
So while I begin this debate holding strongly to my convictions in this area, I reject the notion that a difference of interpretation on this passage would be tantamount to heresy, as some claim. We can differ on our view of the millennium and still be brothers in Christ, as Lucas is my brother. The question before us today is whether or not Revelation 19 and 20 are chronological. However, the real issue is whether Revelation 20 is meant to be understood as happening before or after the return of Christ. Both Lucas and I believe Revelation 19 is the return of Christ. Therefore, for his position to be right, he must prove that these two chapters are meant to be understood as chronological. If I can prove they're not, I've made my case. However, even if I fail to prove my case regarding chronology, I could be right about the timing of the millennium, as many post-millennial advocates see Revelation 19 as regarding the judgment of Christ on Jerusalem in AD 70, which is then followed by the millennium or the church age in Revelation 20. So there are those who would see them as chronological and yet still hold the position that Revelation 20 speaks of now, the church age. I say this because I want to make an important point, that whether you're amillennial or post-millennial, we're on the same side of this debate. Both of us believe the church age is the same as the millennium. Both Amil and Postmill believe the millennium is the interadvental event, meaning it occurs between the first and the second coming of Christ. In fact, up until about 100 years ago, post-millennial, postmillennialism and amillennialism were not formally differentiated. In uh, Kim Riddlebarger's book, he uh, cites Louis Burkhoff, who said, that in his 1938 systematic theology, that the name amillennialism is new indeed, but the view in which it, uh, it has applied is as old as Christianity. Even B.B. Warfield, usually portrayed as postmillennial in his eschatology, remarked to his friend Samuel Craig that amillennialism of this type, held by the esteemed Dutch colleagues Herman Bovink and Abraham Kuyper, is the historic Protestant view, as expressed in the creeds of the Reformation period, including the Westminster Standard. So what I'm saying is this is not to say that post-mill and all-mill are the same. There are differences, but the distinctions lie in the nature, character, and expectations of the millennium, not so much the timing. Both all-mill and post-mill are both post-mill. Jesus returns after the millennium. We can call them inaugurated millennialists, or even there's a phrase called nuke millennialism, which means now millennialism. We believe it's already begun. We believe we're in it, and we believe it is consummated with the return of Christ, where Lucas believes that the church age ends with Christ's return, and then the millennium begins. This means he believes that the millennium is a post-advental event, that it comes after Christ's second coming, but before the eternal state. This introduces an unnecessary interjection not found in any of the New Testament writings regarding the return of Christ. The New Testament presents Christ returning and the eternal state being established. Death is destroyed and victory is forever won. We hear much about this age and the age to come, but nothing of some mysterious intermediate kingdom where Christ returns to rule over an imperfect earth where nations are poised to rise up against him after Satan is finally released. Premillennialism teaches that Christ will return to an imperfect earth. He will reign over an imperfect kingdom, which will end in yet another battle after he has returned for a thousand years. While Lucas's position on the timing of the millennium is popular today among many evangelicals, it is not the majority view of the church. It is not the church historical view, even though some would argue that the premillennial view was held by some of the early church fathers. It has not been the majority view of the church as a whole. As Richard Mueller has observed, quote, the Protestant Orthodox, both Lutheran and Reformed, denied the notion of an early, or excuse me, an earthly millennium to dawn in the future and viewed the text, Revelation 20, as a reference to the reign of grace between the first and second visible coming of Christ, the age of the Ecclesia Militans, or the church militant. So, how do we come to this conclusion? Well, we begin with the context of the passage, overall context and immediate context. Overall context of Revelation is that it is prophetic and apocalyptic. It is a literature written in vivid images which point to greater realities. It is not intended to be taken woodenly literal, nor are the visions given in expressly, explicitly chronological order. The visions are pictures which have to be interpreted and often are recapitulating the same events over and over. Dr. Beale has already been mentioned, but I'll mention him again. G.K. Beale emphasizes that the visions in Revelation are not strictly chronological, but rather cyclical. The visions presented in the book are not meant to be read as a linear sequence of events. Instead, they're often covering the same ground from different perspectives. 
the different visions in Revelation parallel each other, each cycle retelling the story of the end times with varying details of emphasis, and this means that the same events or themes may appear multiple times throughout the book. For instance, the seals, the trumpets, and the bowls are likely not three separate successive acts of judgment, but rather all a retelling of the judgments from different perspectives. The end of the world is depicted in chapter 6, chapter 11, and chapter 16. The final battle is seen in Revelation 16, Revelation 19, and again in Revelation 20. And it's interesting that the word the battle, the word battle there with a definite article, indicates one final battle, the battle, not a battle, but the battle. And it's only used in three specific places, chapter 16, chapter 19, and chapter 20. And they're all pointing to the same event, the final battle. So instead of seeing Revelation as strictly literal and chronological, we should understand it as progressive parallelism. Understanding the visions of Revelation as parallel accounts of the same events, with each cycle progressing the narrative further, providing additional details and additional perspectives. The immediate context of Revelation 19 gives a graphic picture of the coming of Jesus in judgment. And take note what happens in this text, because this is hugely important. Jesus returns in glory to bring judgment on his enemies. The armies of the nations are gathered to make war with him, and in a single act, he destroys the nations, which are gathered against him. He destroys them. At the end of Revelation 19, the enemies of Christ are vanquished. But then in Revelation 20, we're told that Satan is bound not to deceive the nations. What nations? Who? Who is he supposed to be deceiving? These nations have just been slaughtered. They're flesh is being eaten by the, 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 the birds of the air. This is why it's reasonable to see that Revelation is going back to the beginning and giving a new vision. This new vision will tell the story of triumph again from a different vantage point. This view will show the heavenly reality which has occurred throughout the church age. Now, interpreted within this context, we will see that Revelation 20 is going back to the beginning and giving a vision of the church age in three parts. And like any good Baptist, I'm going to alliterate my three parts. The binded, verses 1 to 3, the blessed, verses 4 to 6, and the battled, in verses 7 to 10. So let's look first at the binded, verses 1 to 3. Is this text meant to be taken literally? Well, no one argues that the chain or the key are literal. I guess some people do, but various people, most people don't. But they will argue that the thousand years has to be literal. However, the term thousand is almost always used symbolically everywhere else in Scripture. Psalm 5010 has already been mentioned, but also Psalm 90, verse 4, for a thousand years in your sight are but as yesterday. Psalm 105, verse 8, he remembers his covenant forever, the word that he commanded for a thousand generations. Not a thousand and one, because we got to take it literally. Second Peter 3, 8, but we do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years. Not a thousand and one, because we have to take it literally. With all due respect, arguing for the literal nature of the thousand years is by far the weakest argument for my premillennial friends, and this should not be where our battle rages today. If this is where it goes, that's a real disappointment for this debate. So what does the binding refer to? Well, when Christ came, he bound Satan through the gospel. Satan is bound, not comprehensively, not finally, but specifically in regard to one thing. And this is what it says. It says he is bound in regard to deceiving the nations against Christ and thwarting the proclamation of the gospel. When accused of being an agent of Satan, Jesus was asked a question, and he responded by saying, how can someone enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man? And then he may plunder his house, Matthew chapter 12, verse 29. Well, this is in reference to Christ's work. His work is the binding of Satan. He is binding the strong man. He said that in the passage, Satan is the strong man. Luke 10, 17, when the 72 returned with joy, they said, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he, and he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. That again is an idea of when the gospel is preached, Satan is bound. Colossians 2.15, talking about the work of Christ, says that Christ disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in Christ. The proclamation of the gospel in the world demonstrates the power of Christ over his enemies as his church continues to see converts in every tribe, tongue, and nation, even to this day. If the binding of Satan were final and complete, there would not be a need for a final battle, which all of us affirm. Jesus even declares in John chapter 12, verse 31, now is the judgment of the world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. And when I am lifted up, I will draw all people to myself. 
In this context, Jesus is referring to his impending crucifixion lifted up from the earth and the resulting judgment, which will happen. The prince of this world, the ruler of this world will be cast out. His crucifixion and resurrection signify the defeat of Satan's power to deceive the nations and keep them from believing the gospel and Christ drawing people from every tribe, tongue, and nation to himself. Now, one of the arguments for the rise of the Antichrist figure at the end of the age is that the restrainer will be removed. 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 5 through 8. So, if a restrainer must be removed, that means someone or something is being restrained. What is that thing? It's Satan himself. Satan is currently being restrained. One day the restrainer will, will be removed, not through some secret rapture, but God will remove the restraint, and that will be the unbinding of Satan. Everything fits together when we look at it as a whole. Keep this in mind, guys. The gospel is invincible, not the devil. Jesus is victorious, not the devil. Even in this age where we see drag, queen, drag queens starting the Olympics, looking like they're trying to pretend to be Da Vinci's Last Supper, even in a world like that, Satan is not on the throne. He's not. So we would say that Christ is ruling now, that the church is experiencing spiritual victory now. Satan cannot do all that he wants until he is released from his restraints. So that's the binding. Secondly, we had the blessed. Now, this is uh, an important conversation, which I, I will have to limit because of time. But the question about verses four to six is, where is this? Is this something on earth or is this something in heaven? Well, it refers to thrones. In the book of Revelation, almost 50 times the book, the, the word thrones is used, and almost all the times it's used for thrones in heaven. Martyred souls are in view, similar to Revelation 6, verse 9. Uh, so any there's only like one or two times where thrones is not used, and it's used of the throne of Satan on the earth. It's not used of thrones uh, on the earth. It's used of thrones in heaven. And the first resurrection is, uh, the question is, what does that mean when it talks about the first resurrection? This is something that Lucas brought up in his opening statement. And three options are put forth by amillennialists. One is that the first resurrection is the resurrection of Christ, which we share in by becoming believers and having faith in him. The second is regeneration, which he mentioned. The third is that this could be the intermediate, intermediate state, which is the position taken by Sam Storms. And I think it could be referring to all of that because Christ's resurrection creates our ability to be regenerated. And then when we are regenerated, we are with him. We are seated with him on he in heavenly kingdoms. Now, uh, Paul says in Ephesians 2, we are seated with him. And when we die, we are in the intermediate state with him until his return. It's the very language of the New Testament that before salvation, we are dead in sin. And when we come to Christ and he gives us new life, we are with him seated in heavenly places. Colossians 2.13 says, you were dead in trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, but God made you alive together with him, having forgiven you all your trespasses. And this is even pictured in the Valley of Dry Bones in Ezekiel chapter 37, where regeneration is pictured of the life coming back to the dead dry bones. So, Kenneth Gentry says, and according uh, in, in regard to this subject, he says, according to John, the first resurrection secures the participation of the saints, both dead and living, in the rule of Christ. This refers to the spiritual resurrection of those born again by God's grace. Finally, we get to verse 7 through 10, and this is the battle. This says Satan will be released to make war, deceiving the nations and leading them against the saints. But where are these nations? Where are they coming from? If they were destroyed in 19, which we talked about, if they're already destroyed, if Christ has already destroyed them, their flesh is being eaten by carnivorous fowl, where are these nations coming from? Some people say, well, these are the children who were born during the millennium. But that would mean that glorified saints and resurrected bodies would be giving birth to children and that some of those saints would be giving birth to children who would not themselves become believers. I find this the most problematic issue of premillennialism, which I will explore in cross-examination. The premillennial position posits an interjection of time between this age and the age to come, which has Christ returning to an imperfect world, which remains imperfect, which progressively gets worse while he reigns, and it ends with nations rising up against him. This is not the picture that we are given when we see the rest of the Bible talking about the return of Christ. In fact, I believe this is the scene from Revelation 19, retold there at the end, where it says, that the fire comes down, Lucas mentioned it, but it also says the great white throne comes down. Jesus is there and he is judging. I do believe there is coming a day 
when the straight restraint will be removed from Satan and he will lead a charge against God's people. And I think this coincides with other passages in scripture where we see that, but that onslaught will be brought to an end with the appearance of Christ in his second coming. Now, I want to conclude by considering a few thoughts. One is on the parables of Christ. Those that deal with the return of Christ have a very simple structure, whether it's the parable of the sheep and the goats, the parable of the dragnet, or the parable of the wheats and the tares. They all have one thing in common. They all end with the return, the judgment, that final event. None of them in any way add an event following that age and preceding an age to come. They all go from this age to the age to come. There's no intermediate event in any of Christ's parables of the end. It's a simple structure. Christ came. He's coming again. No secret rapture will precede his coming, and no millennial reign will follow it. Likewise, none of the parables of the kingdom have any mention of a kingdom being established in an instance in the future, but it, the kingdom is something that comes in and changes the world over time, just like the church has done, such as leaven, such as a mustard seed, such as the wheat, which is sown in the field. It changes over time. This is what we see during the church age and why we should conclude that this is the millennial kingdom, because we see the world changing. We see Christ going to all the areas of the earth through the work of evangelism and through missions work. Christ came first to give us new life in him. Believers experience that in regeneration. And when we die, we are with him in glory until his return. And when he returns, he will vanquish his enemies, consummate the millennium, and inaugurate the new heavens and the new earth. And that is the end of my opening statement. Keith, thank you very much for that 20-minute opening statement. Gentlemen, that concludes our opening statements and opening arguments for tonight's great millennium debate. I appreciate the time and work put into those well-spoken opening statements. We got several points on the table to now engage in an uninterrupted rebuttal. And so for the rebuttal, we have 10 minutes each. Lucas, we will throw it back to you and I'll reset the timer whenever you're ready. The floor is yours. You have 10 minutes. And just make sure to hit unmute, Lucas. You might mic unmuted. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you uh, for your opening statement there, Keith. So um, I wasn't I I wasn't sure where he was going with his first five minutes. I was like there was a lot of talk going on and like the post mail stuff. So I really wasn't tracking with that first. Uh, so, but you know, let me just try to respond to some of this. So post mail today is not the post mail of yesterday. I just want to get you know make that clear. Today I call it neo post millennialism, which is a modified version of it. The reason why, if you know your history, the Puritans held to historicism, which interpreted the book of Revelation as a history book unfolding in time. So actually the post mills of yesterday interpreted the revelation, or sorry, the millennial in Revelation 20 as a future dispensation, just like premillennials. So they would actually disagree with Keith and say, no, 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 this is not covering the entire church age. I mean, you can read about this, like Adam Clark talks about this in, in his commentary on Revelation chapter 20. So let's not confuse today's postmillennialism with yesterday's postmillennialism. But again, I wasn't really sure what, what that really has to do with it. There was about five minutes of talk and not a lot of exegesis go, uh, going on. And then after he did this, he, uh, he mentioned and brought up this, this two-age problem. So I can address this and, and I want to address this, but this is a deterrent from our topic. The topic of tonight's debate is, is Revelation 19 and 20 chronological? Now, we do not do exegesis by throwing problems out of text. That's not how exegesis is done. And usually, you know, the problems that we posit are just our own problems. We do exegesis by going to the original intended meaning of the context. So whether or not I, I think there are problems or not, I have to determine, okay, what is the text saying? Once we draw that out, then we can deal with the problems. But our problems do not determine what we will and will not uh, accept. And uh, then he mentioned how pre-mill reigns over somehow in the future, it's going to be Christ reigning over an imperfect world because there's still going to be, I guess he was going along the lines of there's still going to be sin. And then afterwards, Satan's going to be able to deceive uh, some nations. So let me ask you this. Is it better for me to say that the millennial kingdom is now? I mean, look at where our nation is now. Do you think 65 million aborted babies is a more optimistic, better view? Do you think LGBT grooming is a more optimistic view? I mean, if, if premillennialism has Christ reigning over an imperfect world, my gosh, brother, you have Christ reigning over a horrible, sin-wretched world. So let's just, you know, that be clear. 
Then there was some kind of jab at the majority view versus minority view. Let me just say, uh, premillennialism is the only only millennial view that has the word historic attached to it. Uh, millennialism doesn't. Postmillennialism certainly doesn't. So why is this? Could it be that this is the early eschatology of the church? I mean, if you study her church history, it clearly is. Justin Martyr was a, a, a premillennialist. Irenaeus was a premillennialist. Papias was. You know, John himself was, I, um, I believe. I'm just having a little humor there because I know that that's a debate. Um, and now he mentioned after he did this too, again, still not dealing with exegesis. I need exegesis. He mentions Beal says it's not linear. Well, that's a claim. We, you know, you need to show us how it's not linear. He did offer some things and he mentioned the battle of chapter 16, then chapter 19 and chapter 20. So let me say, so there, you know, as I said in my opening statement, there are times in Revelation that recapitulate. So I'm not against recapitulation. But even under the uh, progressive parallelism, which divides Revelation to seven units, even they have chronology. So, you know, progressive parallelism, but even by itself, doesn't rule out the fact that these two chapters could be the same vision cycle. And so a vision cycle could have a chronology. But let's talk about Revelation 16. So in Revelation 16, it's the preparation for the battle of chapter 19. And then the chapter 19, that, that preparation takes place and Christ defeats them. But that's not the same battle. And if you look at the differences between the two, you, you, know, you can clearly see them. Chapter 19, Christ is destroying the armies. In chapter 20, fire out of heaven is destroying them. So just because there, there are parallel accounts or similarities doesn't mean there aren't differences. And we can't acknowledge one without the other. We have to look at, at both of them. Then he mentioned uh, how there's progressive parallelism and how he, he dabbed into the second coming of Christ seems to be absent. And this is a big problem too, because why in the world in chapter 19, if, if John is so clear about Christ's second coming, you would, you would think it's strange for him to be so vague and implicit that fire out of heaven is somehow symbolic for the return of Christ. That, that doesn't make any sense there. You know, you would, you would predict that it would be just as explicit if John is starting over, especially how progressive parallelism in nature is supposed to show you chronological advancement. Then he mentioned how Revelation 19 and 20 and 21, Christ is destroying all the people. I don't think he is at all. He's destroying the armies of the people. That's not the whole world. So, you know, this leads into the next question. What about the nations afterwards post? So uh, let me just mention this. This is not related to the to the topic of tonight's debate or even premillennialism because even premillennials will disagree on this who makes up the people after the millennial that populate the earth or that satan deceives and that's a sub debate within premillennialism that does not determine whether one is or is not a premillennialist nor does it determine the topic of the debate are these two chapters chrono uh, chronological because it could be something that maybe you're just missing in the text or even I'm just missing, or this person is just missing. It doesn't matter. John can still teach too. But I, I, I do take the view, and this is what John, John Gill takes, that the nations that uh, Satan deceives after the thousand years, and he can ask me this on, my, on a cross-examination, that encompasses the dead that are resurrected. And if you look at verse 5, John says the rest of the dead are resurrected after the millennial. And then in verse 3, Satan is released after the millennial. So those events are happening simultaneously. So I believe that the nations that Satan gathers encompass those, those people. Next, he did exactly what I said he, uh, what uh, millennials do. He quoted Psalms 50, 10, the thousand, you know, the cattle on a thousand hill are, are God to say somehow this isn't literal. So I want to say something here. Imagine if I debated James White on Romans chapter nine, and we got to verse 13, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. And I use John 3, 16 in my debate to interpret that. If you know James White, you know that he would chew me out for that and say that's two different contexts. I'm saying the same thing over here. You can't bring in all these contexts that Keith brought in. Tons of contexts. He, he brought in Matthew 12, exactly what I said, to interpret these contexts. You need to deal with this intended meaning and then walk through it consistently to show me that you're exegesis, not by telescoping from the portions of scripture. You need to show me how these two chapters are chronological in this debate. So all those verses that you brought up were not irrelevant, were not relevant to this debate. But I will say in Matthew 12, Matthew 12, when Christ is talking there, that's not the cross of Christ yet. So he's uh, so he is forecasting that. So the timing is a little off on that. Now I want to go into the thrones of chapter four and six. So the thrones here should be interpreted within their context. You look at verses one through three of Revelation chapter 20. The angel comes down out of heaven. Where's he coming? He's coming to earth. Satan is bound. He's bound for a thousand years. I do believe those are literal years, but that's not 
dependent upon my position. But I'm saying all the t c the contextual evidence shows us that verses one through three are on the earth. Uh, Satan can't deceive the nations. Again, the angel came out of heaven. He went to earth to bind Satan. The context has to do with on the earth. So, so the thrones, I don't believe there's a break in the text that somehow it goes from earth to heaven. I believe those thrones are on the earth. And the reason why, because the saints are reigning with Christ on the earth, which Revelation 5 10 says the saints will reign on the earth. So, so there's no problem there. And the throne should be interpreted within, the, within their respected context, which is what we're supposed to, to do to today. Now, I also want to mention, this is very important, how his he interprets the coming to life of the saints, and he takes an all-encompassing view. Okay, uh, that's fine, but either way, that doesn't escape your problem, because if you look at these souls that John is seeing, they're already Christians. They're already Christians. What does that tell us? They're already born again. They're already spiritually reigning with Christ. So when John says to these people who are already born again, who are already reigning with Christ spiritually, they're coming to life. What's that addition there? The only thing that happens after death to that addition that is coming to life, that, that is resurrection language, is the bodily resurrection. And you see this even in chapter five. The rest of the dead did not come to life until a thousand years later. He's saying one group over here was resurrected bodily. And the other, the rest of the group won't be resurrected, the same type of resurrection they had until a thousand years later. And this is what George Eldon Land would point out, which I didn't quote in my opening statement because of time's sake. But this is really a deciding factor or Lad thinks that this is the deciding factor, which means that if he's wrong about this resurrection, Keith has to take this position. If he's wrong about this resurrection here, he's wrong about Revelation 19 and 20 being recapitulatory because it's following after the second coming of Christ. That concludes my uh, rebuttal period. I look forward to our cross-examination period, and hopefully we can get get into, into the nitty-gritty and try to bring out and draw out our differences. Thank you. Lucas, thank you very much for your 10-minute rebuttal. Now we're going to hand it back to Keith. I'll reset the timer. Keith, whenever you're ready, you also have a 10-minute rebuttal. Go ahead. Yes, sir. Thank you. And thank you, Lucas, for uh, your thoughts on that. And uh, want to want to just walk through a few thoughts as I was listening. Uh, a lot was said. One specific thing happened um, at the beginning as as Lucas was making his argument. He was arguing for the use of and as being sequential and uh, that the conjunction always references sequence. And then he says, but it doesn't always, it can be this over here, you know, but, but it has to here. It has to, because he is, he's already determined the end. He's already determined what he's going to and how he's going to interpret this passage. And while he's claiming exegesis, he's claiming to say this, I'm, I'm, I'm simply getting this from the text. He's already, but he, he's, he's, he's drawing an a priori conclusion. He's saying, well, well, this has to be because this is his position. This is the, the position that he's arguing from. And I, I'm not saying that we don't all do that in some respect. We all sort of have these ideas that we, that we introduce. Um, but at the end of the day, the, the reason why he's saying it has to be this, even though it's not this over here, I'll give you an example. Maybe, maybe this would be a better example. And that's the idea of recapitulation. He says, I'm not against recapitulation over here. But I am over. I am against recapitulation here because this can't be re recapitulation. Because if it is, it destroys my argument, and so it becomes a well. What's the deciding factor? What's the deciding factor? How do you decide what's recapitulation and what's not? Well, that's where my argument comes in, which he has tried to dismiss by saying, "Well, Keith has raised irrelevant arguments." I didn't raise irrelevant arguments. I raised arguments he doesn't want to deal with because it's those very arguments that are going to show that this sequential argument that he's making, this argument that it has to be after the return of Christ, there's this thousand years, even though we can find so many problems with that, even though we can introduce so many problems with that he's going to say, well, that's an inner, that's an inner debate among premillennialists and we don't want to touch that. No, we have to touch that because we have to do exegesis according to the rules of context and comparing scripture with scripture. If we don't compare scripture with scripture, if we don't use the method of looking at the whole of scripture, not just the pieces, not just this one part, but we compare this to everything, we see that the argument of this interjected kingdom following the return of Christ does not fit. And that's the problem. You have death ending because Christ has come. He has defeated death. First Corinthians 15, death is swallowed up in victory. 
but it's not. There's another thousand years of death, disease, and destruction. And you say, well, that's that's irrelevant to the debate. No, it's it is the debate. That's the debate. If this is chronological, then this is introducing something that none of the rest of scripture ever points to promises this is not the blessed hope the blessed hope is not a kingdom to come where we still have death disease and destruction the blessed hope is a kingdom with no end not a thousand year end but no end that will last forever and that kingdom is where the sun will be the the light and the new jerusalem all these things that we see after the destruction of this world and the introduction of the new world to come. And so I, I think that we have to consider the fact that even though the arguments are being said to be irrelevant, I don't believe that they are. Um, and so uh, walking back through again, trying to write as he was speaking, this uh, uh, having to uh, having to write down these things, he talks about Revelation 20, and he said Christ's second coming is not mentioned in Revelation 20. So if you look, if you if you limit it to verses one to ten, you might could make that argument. You could say, well, in verse nine it says, and they marched up over the broad plain on the earth and were surrounded by the camp of the saints and the beloved city, and fire came down from heaven and consumed them. That could be a picture of judgment. I certainly believe that it is. I believe it's a picture of Christ's second coming, a recapitulation of what was said in verse in chapter 19. But here's the key: if we go beyond verse 10, we find verse 11. Then I saw the great white throne and him who was seated on it. Yes, this is Christ's return. It's right there. It's in verse 11. His presence, from his presence, earth and sky fled away. There was no place found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne and the books were opened. That's the picture of judgment. If you read all of the parables, you find judgment just that way. The dead and the dead and and the the living in Christ and the dead are brought before the throne and they are separated. And so what you have with premillennialism is you have multiple resurrections, you have multiple multiple physical resurrections, you have multiple judgments and you have all of this divided up unnecessarily by this interjection of this kingdom, which can easily be interpreted other ways. Now, I realize that this was not part of his opening statement, but I do want to say something about the fact he asked why I began with the subject of postmillennialism. My only point, and I know this is a little off, maybe I shouldn't even do this, really not fair, but I do want to respond and simply say, I'm just simply saying that with postmillennialism and amillennialism in this debate, we are on the same side. That was my argument. So I'll I'll leave my rebuttal there. Hello, Keith. Thank yeah. you very much for that rebuttal. Let me just reset the timer here. And okay, gentlemen, great job. That concludes opening statements and rebuttals. Again, we got plenty of great points on the table to now address in cross examinations. We got plenty of time to ask each other questions and discuss tonight's topic on the millennium. Keith just ended with his 10 minute rebuttal. And therefore, Lucas, we're going to give you the first 25 minutes to lead the way in cross exam. Gentlemen, the floor is yours. Go ahead. We thought we, uh, we lost you there for a minute, Donnie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, but you know, great to be here here with you, Keith. Keith, before we begin, I just want to say it's an honor to be to share this platform with you. Yeah, I'm glad to be here too. Thank you, my and pleasure. you as well. All right. So my first question will be: Do you, uh, do you agree that verse five of chapter twenty is a bodily resurrection of the dead? Uh, yeah. Okay. And do you agree that the phrase in verse five did not come to life until a thousand years are completed? Is a negative statement of John to communicate? that the dead are resurrected at a later time than the saints? In this, if if for, for you to arrive at that conclusion, you would have to assume that the idea of resurrection and in, in, in all of these instances being brought to life and the resurrection, all these things are all referring to the same type of, of resurrection. I know you do. I know that's the assumption yeah. that you are making, but that's what you would have to, to, to do is you would have to flatten it out and say this is only referring to one form or type of resurrection and it can't be referring to anything else. Gotcha. So if if I told you, and I mentioned this in my opening statement, if I told you that I was flu vaccinated yesterday, mm -hmm. but the rest of my family did not become flu vaccinated until a week later, would you assume that both me and my family received the same flu vaccination regardless of the time difference? 
Sure. I think that's an oversimplification, but yes. Oh, so you would. Okay. Okay. So when John says in verse four that the saints came to life, right after that, it says in verse five, the rest of the dead did not come to life until a thousand years later. If the dead here are bodily, as you admit they are, how is John not saying that both groups, regardless of the time difference, are bodily resurrected? Okay. Uh, show me where it says the word saints in verse four. I see the souls oh. of those who are, have been beheaded. Is the word saints there? Oh, uh, I'm using saints just to clarify because you're big, assuming. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there's a big language barrier there, but let's call them saints for the sake of clarification, you know, martyrs, however you want to say it. Okay. So restate your question. Yeah, sure. So if uh, you agreed in that sentence that both me and my family would be fl flu vaccinated. So my question is, whether you call these saints or Christians are martyred or, or martyrs, John is saying these people came to life. And then in verse five, right after this, the rest of the dead did not come to life until a thousand years after. If the dead are bodily resurrected in verse five, as you admit, how is John not saying that both groups, regardless of the time difference, are bodily resurrected? Okay. So again, if we look at this, it, as Sam Storms has pointed out, is is if we look at this as an intermediate state reference, and I said that's a possibility in my opening statement, then certainly we would say that this is referring to them living in, and and being in being in life with Christ during the intermediate state, which is something that the unbeliever does not experience uh, until the resurrection. Now, the unbeliever is conscious in the intermediate state, at least I believe so based on Luke 16, but that's still not ever defined as life. Uh, the, the, the unbeliever has never said it to experience life in the same way we do. And so there is a distinction here between the two types of resurrection as again, we can flat it out as you, as you have in your, uh, in your okay, flu vaccination, yeah. uh, example. But I think in this sense, we have to look at it from a broader, uh, state. Okay, uh, so I'm not really getting an answer. So if you admit in that sentence example that both me and my family would be flu vaccinated, I'm borrowing, as you know, from John's language. John is saying the saints here are bodily resurrected in verse five. The rest of the dead aren't until a thousand years later. Mm -hmm. How is John then not saying that both groups, regardless of the time difference, are bodily resurrected? Okay, this again, because I'm saying there's a difference between the word resurrection, your flu vaccination, you're making the argument that it's a one to one parable parallel. I'm saying I disagree with you. I don't think there's a one to one parable parallel in your argument. So that, that's my answer is I don't think the first resurrection, I don't think the reference to the souls of those who've been uh, beheaded. Uh, uh, excuse me, those who uh, who came to life ruling and reigning with Christ for a thousand years, I don't think came to life. There is the same as the idea of those who. Uh, came to life in verse five. I do see a difference. Yes. So, okay. Uh, were the saints in verse four, were they resurrected prior to the dead? No, they're alive. They've been alive since they came to Christ. They were made alive in Christ and they are okay. living in the intermediate state. Was so that they are, they are gotcha. living and alive. We, when we come, here's a point. When we are regenerated, when we are born again, we are alive in Christ. When we die, we are still alive in Christ, and we continue to be alive all the way until judgment. Okay, yeah. We continue to live. That. So that, that life continues. That, that life is something that is in us, and it's life that we have from the moment that we are born again. Okay, uh, I get your view. So um, if I can just get like a yes or no. In, in verse 4, did the saints come to life prior to the dead in verse 5? Yes, because I'm saying they okay. don't come. To de they don't come gotcha. alive. Into yeah, I'll just you. say yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. And then verse five, John says the rest of the dead did not come to life until a thousand years later, and you want that interpreted as two different types of resurrection rather than John just saying one group is resurrected prior, one group is resurrected after. Yes. Okay. So uh, let me ask you this question then. In verse four. Uh, you could just you know restate because I, I know you mentioned this in your opening statement. You uh, you interpret the coming to life as it sounds like both regeneration and reigning or intermediate state. Yeah, is that correct? I said it could be all three, and I think that all three work together because it, and and even I would include the resurrection of Christ as being referencing the first resurrection. It says He is the first fruit of the resurrection, and we who come after Him are are coming after Him because He is the first fruit of the resurrection, okay. and we are born again. We are raised up in heavenly places with Him, seated in heavenly places with Him, where we reign uh, with Him. 
Okay, gotcha. So do you believe and agree with me that the saints who come to life are already born again and spiritually reigning with Christ? Yes, but it's not that that's not to say that it can't be the same the the, the same referent there. So when John says that these Christians, if you admit and agree with me, are already born again, they're already reigning with Christ, what is that resurrection or what is that coming to life that they're be that they're getting that they don't already have? Okay, again, if it is if it is a referent, if that referent in verse five is to the intermediate state, then it's the death. It it is what happens at death. We are with Christ physically or spiritually, not physically. Oh, so you don't believe it's regeneration then? No, I said regeneration is the cause. This is why I put it all together. This is why I'm saying that because of the resurrection of Christ, we are regenerated, born again, and we never stop living. OK, we never stop living, even though we die. So we continue to live. And even at death, we live with Christ. And so this would have been a great blessing and benefit to those who are watching Christians be persecuted and killed to know that they continue to live even after death. OK, uh, I'll conclude this section just for time's sake, and I'll let the audience judge on that. Um, if we go to now to verse 10 of chapter 20. So my question to you is, uh, I'll read the text, and the devil who deceived them was thrown to the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and false prophet are, and they will be tormented day, night, forever and ever. My question to you is, is Satan being thrown to the lake of fire chronologically from the beast and false prophet here? Yeah, and this is where um, would might take more time than you want to give in the Q and A section as to you like a nutshell. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, so the beast and the false prophet. I, I take a partial preterist view of. Uh, portions of Revelation, and, and, and I do hold an old, early uh, view of Revelation. And so that would put me as seeing such as the beast as being Nero. That, that's fairly simple uh, understanding from my position. Not it's simple. I don't want to say it's simple for everybody, but but in that, posi in that yeah. position, that puts me as saying, okay, the beast and the false prophet references something that has already taken place in the past, not something that's going to take place in the future. However, I do believe that it creates a motif that over time there are these uh, thing, th these organizations or groups or, or even nations that rise up against uh, Christ. And there tends to be a central figure ahead within that. And so there is a, I think, a referent and possibly uh, a coming antichrist at the end. I think that's actually probably. But do you believe that, um, sorry, not to interrupt you just for time's sake. So, but do you believe, you know, my question was, is that, is Satan getting cast into the lake of fire after the beast and false prophet are, regardless of who you believe they are? Well, well, but but who I believe they are matters to the question because if it if 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 it is Nero, if that's if that's the reference, then yeah, that's already happened. So Satan being cast in like oh. fire at the return of Christ, that become that comes later. So, so yeah. You, so does John have Revelation nineteen in mind here when he mentions that the beast and false prophet? No, that's why I was talking. That's why I was trying to go with my. That, that's you do what okay. Oh, so you. Okay, gotcha. Sorry, I'm going to interrupt you. Sorry, brother. No, it's okay. This is where this becomes more difficult. Yeah. I believe the beast and the false prophet create a motif that goes through time that takes more of an idealist approach. But at the end, I do think there is going to be rising up one who will be what some call the Antichrist figure or the beast figure at the end. And I do believe that will take place prior to the destruction of Satan, but not a thousand year distinction. I think that is the, the that happens chronologically, but not, but not over a thousand years. Uh, just to clarify, so um, John does have Revelation 19 in mind here when he mentions this in verse 10. I didn't say that. I, if, if that's okay, what you yeah, think, I I that wasn't I what maybe. I, no, no, no. I, I believe that John is recapitulating the story of redemption with Satan as the focus and Satan is the beginning and ending focus of this. Gotcha. And that's what, that's what I see. Yeah. If, if we just focus on this text without getting into all that preterism view, <clears throat> Do you agree that that John here is saying the devil is thrown in after the beast and false prophet are? Yeah, that's what I said. Chronologically, it's not a problem. Okay, so let me ask you this then. If, if you were to compile a list of all the possible verses that, that are evidence of these two chapters being chronological, would you be willing to admit that this verse is, is at least possible for indicating that? Yes, but again, if this is where I said at the beginning, and 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 and, I, and I'm not conceding the debate, but I am saying yeah. there are those on my side, those who would say the the millennium ends with Christ's return, who do take a chronological approach and say that the Revelation 19 is actually the fall of Jerusalem. I don't take that view, so I didn't want to defend that view. But there yeah. are those who say that's 
the way that you are to understand it and they take a chronological perspective. Well, That's not my position. Gotcha. Yeah. I mean, I don't see how that helps your position because your position tonight is that these you're taking the negative that this is not chronological and it seems like you're allowing for some kind of continuity with, with this verse between these two chapters here. Sure. But as you and I both know, this is, there's more than chronology at stake here. There's the, the actual, and I understand chronology is the heart of the debate. And I understand that was my choice. They even, uh, I mean, you can point that out later <laughs> yeah. if you want to feel free. I was the one who came up with the idea for that thesis is the chronology. But the point I'm making is that ultimately chronology is going to depend on the nature of the millennium. That's my point is that the nature of the millennium will determine whether or not it's coming after this event in 19. If I believe the 19 is the end, Christ returns, then that to me precludes chronology because okay, I uh, don't believe chapter 20 can come after Christ has returned because death is swallowed up in victory. Okay. Uh, I'm not, I'm not really sure, you know, again, I'm not sure how, how this helps your view. So uh, let me ask you this. I quoted Anthony Hokema and he says, if chapter 19 is second coming in Christ and does follow, and, and chapter 20 does follow this, we are virtually compelled to believe premillennialism. Do you agree with that? No, no. no I, and that's no. why I said, that's why I said, even if, even if the debate tonight, even if I lose the chronology debate, it still doesn't mean that the millennium comes after the return of Christ. It, uh, and again, it depends on how you interpret chapter 19. You debated uh, a man from the Anglican church, the yep. ACNA on this, I, yeah. I don't know if it's this program. No, but mine. It, Okay, you debated yeah. a man on your program who Great made guy. the point. He believed it was chronological because yeah. he believed that um, Revelation 19 was fulfilled, uh, I, I guess, through the church age. He didn't say it was 80, 80, 70. But in that, there's a person who's saying that the, the nature of the millennium is what matters. And that's how you determine chronology. So you would still be an amillennialist, you're saying, if, if these chapters were chronological? I think it's possible. I think it might lend itself more to a post-millennial view if I, if I took that view. Okay. Uh, let me ask you another question just because we're running out of time quick. Um, if you were to imagine that, are you what, I, actually, because you, you agree or you possibly can uh, accept some kind of chron uh, chronology, I'm actually going to skip that question though, because I'm a little, uh, that we would just be re uh, repeating ourselves. So let's now move into this section. So um, Christ's second coming in chapter 20, which, which I want to talk about. So you, is it your position that the fire out of heaven is Christ's return or chapter or verse 11 is Christ's return? I think it's all one event. I think it's it's being uh, seen as one event. The, the verse nine um, is the fire coming down from heaven. The devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur. The beast and the false prophet are there and they are termed a day and night forever. Then I saw the great white throne. That's Christ's return. And all of this is happening in at the same time, I don't think it's a, I don't think it's a, uh, well, this happened before. I think it's all happening at once. Do you believe then that, is it your position that the fire out of heaven is symbolic for Christ? I think it's symbolic of judgment in the same way that we see the fire coming out of heaven uh, for the prophets of Baal, which consumed uh, the, the, uh, when Elijah was there and all those things, it's a picture of judgment. Yes. Do you think that's implicit or explicit that this is the second coming of Christ? Oh, I think the 11 is explicit. I'm sorry. Well, verse seven is what I was talking about. The fire out of heaven. Well, verse nine, but still. I'm sorry, verse, um, uh, is it verse nine? Yeah, oh, verse nine. You're right, correct. Yeah. Thank uh, you. But, but, no, it's fine. Verse nine, I think, again, is that's not where my argument's based on. I'm saying the fire can be a picture of judgment. It is a picture of judgment in other places. But verse 11, you said that the return of Christ is not here. And I'm saying if you go one verse later, he, it is here. And that's that's the point I was making. Okay. And do you believe that that is implicit or explicit? Explicit. Then I saw a great white throne and him who seated on upon it. Who is that other than Christ? Do, uh, do you think average reader, if they read this, they would interpret that as the second coming of Christ? Absolutely. In the same way that when Jesus talks about in Matthew chapter 25, the, 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 the sheep and the goats brought before the throne and separated. Absolutely. Because that's what we see right after this. We see the books open, the dead are judged. We see this this happening right here. So your position is that the second coming of Christ is in, I'm sorry, is explicit in verse 11. That's your position? Yep. Do you know any Amil scholar who agrees with you on that? Don't know. Either do I. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, uh, let me uh, ask you these questions now. I want to talk about the ands because uh, I mentioned that in my opening statement. I want to talk about it uh, with you. So in uh, verse 11 of chapter 19, John John sees Jesus on a white horse and he says, and, and then you drop down to verse 14, he <laughs> says, 
and the armies which are in heaven were following him. Do you believe the and here is chronological from verse 11? Yeah. And, right. and, and if it saves time, I can say I'm going to agree with most of the ones you're about to ask. OK, Go, okay. okay gotcha. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. OK, uh, but then your position. So uh, let me just start then in verse uh, 20, 21 of Revelation 19. You, you know, there's three ands there. Dr. Beal agrees those ands are chronological. And it seems like you do, too. And then your position is that right after this chronological pattern of ands for historical sequence, your position is that verse one of chapter 20 recapitulates. Is that correct? Yeah. And I would take Beale's a similar position to Beale and that's saying that we see the angel coming down. This is beginning a new portion of the narrative. Revelation is given in visions and these visions are not always connected chronologically one to another, even if the word, the Kai, which is the Greek and is there can be translated and or then, because as it is in the ESV, it's translated then it's not always a, uh, a coupling of, of sequence. Okay. And, and then you, do you also agree with Dr. Beale that the majority of ands in chapter 20 are chronological? Uh, sure. As I said before. So it seems like then, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, you would then agree with me that there's a consistent pattern of ands that are chronological between these two chapters. Well, I, I, I would have to go back and look at each one specifically to give you an answer as to say whether it's a majority or not. But I'm agreeing with you because you seem to have done the legwork before I did to, to see if these are, are sequential. And I think the majority of them probably would be, but it doesn't have to be. And that's the point that I'm making. Okay, and, and I agree with you on that. That it doesn't have to be. Um, so you know, you know, that's why, like, I'm asking the, uh, these questions of the of, mm. of, of the data, which you seem to be agreeing on that there is a consistent ands being used that are indicating a historical sequence. Would that be correct? Yeah, as I said. Uh, I, the, okay. Th yeah, throughout yeah. The, the the word Kai, typically uh, in a narrative, is is introducing a sequence, even though it doesn't always have to. And that's where we have to ask the question: What else does this imply, or what else do we have to have to come up with if that's the case? Okay. And on that note, let's talk about the binding of Satan. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. This is a, uh, this will be a fun one. So I, do wanna, I don't want to take away from your time. If if for any reason my power goes out, I hope it doesn't. But oh, I've no, just been very God. loud thunder. <laughs> Don't take away his time, Donnie. I just want to say if it goes out, I promise to come back. But uh, no hopefully, that, hopefully that won't happen. I can okay. jump on my cell phone if I have to, but hopefully. Uh, <laughs> Please, God, don't let that happen. Yes. Amen. 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 All right. Um, is it your position that, uh, that the binding of Satan in chapter 20 happened at the cross of Christ? Uh, death, burial, and resurrection. I would say it's all, again, not to flatten out the event, but I would say well, even then, I would say it, it, it is it is the it is the institution of the new covenant of Christ, which is in His advent. And so, this is where because I know I kind of think I know where you're going with this. So let me just preempt the question by okay. saying it is His advent that introduces the binding of Satan. We see Him binding Satan throughout His ministry with the work that He does, and He explicitly says that that's what He's doing. And we see Him, we see His followers doing it. We see that explicitly stated by Him as they come back from preaching. So I don't think it happened at the moment He died on the cross or at the moment He resurrected. I think this is His advent, His coming uh, is a binding. Uh, okay, so do you, uh, do you then believe the atone uh, Christ work on the cross then was it not the official binding of it, or it was just a part of it. I'm I'm trying to understand your position here. I think I think Christ is is bound at the advent of Christ in the sense that Christ is coming into the world and binding Satan. I don't I, I'm not going to say it happened at this moment okay. because we see his him referencing it prior to the cross. So I wouldn't say that it's limited uh, to to that moment. I think okay. there is a binding that occurs. Uh, prior to that. Gotcha. Just because we have five minutes left, uh, let me then ask you this now. <clears throat> so I, I contrasted the abyss of chapter 20 with chapter nine of Revelation. And in chapter nine, an angel opens the abyss, and then out of the abyss come demonic beings. So my question to you is, prior to that angel opening the abyss in chapter nine, were the demons confined to the abyss? Yeah, I'm sorry. I had to go in my mind. I'm going back to chapter nine. That's great. I kind of uh, it's in. Yeah, it's in uh, verse 11. He calls it the abyss. And then uh, he opens the bottomless pit is open and then out come these demonic beings and they, they torment the people of the earth. Mm -hmm. So prior to him opening the abyss, did those demons have access to the to the earth? Um, 
I would have to, I, I, I want to give you the answer that, that, that my, my initial answer would be probably not, I think, the, but, but I would have to give more thought to that to okay. give it, to give it a, a, a better answer had, had not. Gotcha. So let's go off of probably not though. If yeah, it makes me think of 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 what we what we hear about in Jude, where Jude talks about those particular ones who have been bound, who have been kept under uh, chains for a certain time. So that's what that's what that's what comes to mind. But again, I'd have to I'd have to think okay. more about that before giving you a perfect answer. Okay, well, um, I can respect that, but let me just ask you: if if Satan, if if say this was they they weren't allowed to have access because they're in the abyss. Chapter twenty says. Satan has a chain on him. He's thrown into the abyss. That ab that abyss's door is closed. That 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 door is shut and sealed. Yeah, your position is that Satan still has access to the earth. Where? Okay, so we're we're back in Revelation twenty, right? Yep. Yeah, because I'm contrasting the two, the abyss. But I don't see a door shut and she sealed. I see I see a specific binding Verse uh, for a specific thing. And he sees the dragon, the ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and he bound him for a thousand years. He threw him into a pit. Okay, shut and sealed. Okay, I'm sorry, I was looking at yeah, verse two. three. Yeah, it's shut okay. and sealed, and so that he might not deceive the nations. That's what he is being bound for, or being bound to, is the absolute deceiving of the nations. It's not an absolute binding or a complete binding. At least that is my position. This is a binding which is a binding regarding the deception of the nations. It's limited by the the words of the of the phrase. Therefore, it is limited in scope. Okay, so so you would then say Satan being the abyss doesn't mean he's actually in the abyss. Is that your position? Well, I don't, is the word pit, is that the same word as the word abyss? Abusos, yes, it is. I'm looking here now. Uh, yeah, I, I see this again as, as I've said before, I think this is a picture of the binding of Satan. I think the term here is symbolic. I do not think that he is bound completely during this time. Uh, one more question, just because we got like two minutes left. I just want to go go to Revelation 2, verse 8. I mentioned this in my opening statement, too. Uh, Jesus says, uh, the first and the last who was dead and has come to life. So that phrase, come to life, is the same phrase that John uses in verse 4 of chapter 20 for the saints and the dead. Do you agree with me on that? I'm I'm sorry to ask you again, and I'll give you extra time if I need to. Show me where we are again, because I... I oh, that's okay. Yeah, uh, Revelation chapter 2, really verse back. 8. Chapter, chapter two of Revelation, and then verse. Oh, chapter eight. two. Okay, yep. see, that's where I was confused. Okay, so I was in twenty, verse eight. Okay, so two, verse eight. Yes, he says the first and the last who was dead and has come to life, and that phrase, even in the Greek, is the mm -hmm. same phrase that John uses of the saints and the dead when he says they come to life. Do you mm -hmm. agree with me on that? Uh, came to life. The word zao is 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 the word that's being used there. I, I guess I assume I agree with you until I discern. Okay. Uh, until I, I mean, I, I, I'm not sure what you're going to ask. So, uh, uh, the, is that is that well? Uh, my question would be then: Is that a bodily resurrection of Christ there? Oh, is this the it, it, this is referring uh, the words of the first last who died? Yes, this is a bodily. Yes, sure. Okay, and so when John says in verse four of chapter twenty, the saints same same phrase came to life. And we share in Christ's resurrection. You're saying that's actually a spiritual resurrection, and not a bodily like Christ. Yeah, and and again, I want to go back to. Uh, I, I I think I'm quoting Sam Storm, so and I'm going to quote him loosely. So forgive me if I if I uh, no problem if I do. Um, he said that um, there there is a sense in which when we come to this passage and we look at the word raised or came to life, we are, we are spiritualizing this because we believe that this is to be understood spiritually. This is, this is one of the few times where we do that because in other places it's explicitly physical bodily resurrection. But in this case, in revelation 20, we do come to the conclusion based on several other factors that this is spiritual, uh, spiritual resurrection. My time is up. That's right. There we go. 25 minutes has flown by good job gentlemen in the first cross exam fast paced engaging i appreciate it okay i'm resetting the timer and we have our next 25 minute portion of this cross examination keith you get to lead the way and go ahead i'll start the timer on your first question all right lucas thank you again for for doing this it really means a lot and I, I'm, I'm having a good time even though it may not look like it <laughs> um 
All right. So the first few questions should should be pretty quickly. Um, do the Gospels anywhere give us an explicit teaching about a thousand year reign after the return of Christ? OK, uh, so two things. There's a part of me that doesn't want to go there because of, of the nature of this the topic tonight. It's a good question. And I, and I know you're asking it and it is relevant to, this, to the overall debate, just not this topic. But I do want to say, though, is that Christ is the one who gave this revelation to John. So I would say even in these chapter, Christ did teach an intermediate state because chapter 21 is the creation of the new heavens. 19, he comes. And then what comes in between that is the thousand year reign. Okay. So uh, the, I'm gonna, I was going to ask several questions. It sounds like you really don't want to deal with them. And that is how this fits with the analogy of scripture. Are you, un, are you unwilling to answer questions about other passages, how they may approach our understanding of Revelation 20? So the example I gave was in my rebuttal, I said, if I was debating James Wayne in Romans 9 and try to bring in John 3, 16, he would chew me apart. And I think you know he would too, Keith. Sure. I'm saying you're doing this here when you're trying to bring another context to interpret these two chapters. Okay. How is it another context when I'm asking you about other passages that relate to the end and the return of Christ? How is it a different context? Well, we, uh, are you talking about Matthew 12, 12 now? Well, Matt, any because I was going to ask you about the parables. I was going to ask you about Matthew 12. I'm going to ask you about these passages because they're all relevant to how we understand Revelation 20. Are we not to use analogia scriptura? Are we not to compare scripture with scripture? Well, well, we are, but not when we agree on a debate topic. And again, I think you know James White. Again, if I did this with Romans 9, I mean, listen to, to his Leighton Flowers debates. He critiques them all day long for this. So if you were, if I was James White and you were Leighton Flowers <laughs> right now, he would chew you apart for this. And I think you know this, Keith. Okay, but I'm not. All right, but you, you're not answering my question. Well, no, uh, I, I, I actually did answer. I said, Jesus is the, rev uh, Jesus, Jesus is the one who gave his revelation. So in chapter 21, you have the new creation. Chapter 19, you have the coming of Christ. What comes between that? Chapter 20. So you do have a, a thousand year reign. Okay. Uh, well, I'm, I'm going to keep asking a few questions you're not going to like, but we're just going to have to deal with it because okay. these are important questions. In Genesis chapter one and two, we are told two, uh, two accounts of creation, and many people believe they're conflicting and contradictory. Do you believe that's the case? Oh, I definitely don't believe they're contradictory. Okay. Do you believe they tell the same story in two ways? Oh yeah, and I would even you, um, I would be fine using the word recapitulation. Okay. So if we do that there with the earliest part of the scripture, why is it wrong to do it in the latest part of the scripture as we're looking at Revelation 19 and 20? Yeah, so that is a good, uh, that's a fantastic question. And this is why I did deal with this in my opening statement. I said, I'm not against recapitulation. And what I argued is, is that the narrative has to, to show it. So as the argument I gave was that there, there's a chronology of ands being used for historical sequence. We don't see what we see in chapter 11 and 12 going on, on with a change in the narrative. And we, and we also have other problems with what's the resurrection in verse four is Satan bound now after the millennial. So I'm again, I, I'm willing to submit to the text that recapitulation is a biblical truth. It happens many times in revelation and in other parts, I'm saying these two chapters here don't qualify. So I, I, I not to take up too much time, but I, I can't just, just say a chapter, uh, recapitulates. I have to deal with the context and have textual data. So I don't believe the textual data favors uh, recapitulation here. Okay. All right. So I am going to ask you the question about the strong man because you we're talking about the binding of Satan. Yeah. Okay. When Jesus said he has bound the strong man, in Matthew 12, 29, Mark, Mark 3, and Luke 11, how do you interpret that? Okay. So we're going after. So I just want the audience to know what we're doing now. You're taking me out of these two chapters. I'll answer, but I just want to, to, to be aware of what's going on here. You're not dealing with the context. But let's do this. Uh, let's go into this, though, just so there's an answer. So I take Lad's position. Lad said in the meaning of the millennial that this, this, speaking of Matthew 12, is different from the binding of Satan in chapter 20 of Revelation. The former meant the breaking of the power of Satan, that individual men and women might be delivered from his control. The latter binding meant that he should deceive the nations no more. So I do believe there was a redemptive binding of Satan, as I said in my, op my opening statement, too. However, Chapter 20 is a political one, and that's why he has the phrase, the purpose clause, so he won't deceive the nation. So I'm not conflating the two. There's two different bindings, and two things can be true at the same time. 
Okay. Is the t- entire book of Revelation meant to be read in chronological order? No. And this is where I would agree with dispensationalists too. It's, it's definitely not, it's definitely not a strict chronology at all. Are you a dispensationalist? No, no. Okay. I, I, I knew the answer. I just wanted people yeah, okay. to, Thank you. <laughs> to, to hear that. No, no, no. I, I knew, but I just, you, you mentioned it. Yeah. <laughs> um, in Revelation 1, 5 to 6, it says he has uh, loved us and freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priests to, uh, uh, priest to his God and Father. What kingdom is he referring to there? Of heaven, of Christ. Okay. Is that kingdom a reality now? Yeah, so I believe in an already not yet reality. I, you know, I'm sure you do too. Well I, well, I know you do too. Is Christ ruling now? Oh, yeah. Amen. Okay. All right. Um so how do you determine what's literal, spiritual, and what's physical or uh, figurative in when you're interpreting Revelation? How do you come to that conclusion? Yeah, that's a great question. So a good rule of thumb is to see if the literal interpretation is absurd. So if it's absurd, like, you know, Christ, when, when, when John sees a, Christ as a lamb slain, Christ isn't in, in the body of a literal lamb. So we know they're symbolic. So I'm actually not against sim- symbolism at, at all. Neither is premillennialism. We're just saying that symbolism is not meant to obfuscate truth. It's meant to reveal truth. Like revelation is a revealing. So even in, if you go to chapter one, where John sees Christ standing and there's seven golden lampstands, those seven golden lampstands are symbols that correspond to the seven churches. So these symbols are actually revealed truth rather than obfuscate truth. So, okay. Uh, hopefully that answers. I'm glad you said that. I'm glad you said that. In okay. fact, I want you to say it again. What was the reason that you would know? It would. Uh, it, well, the first one is is the interpretation absurd. Is it absurd? Okay, good. I'm glad you said that because now I want to ask you some questions about the millennium and how you understand it. When Christ returns prior to the millennium, in your view, will his saints then be raised in glorified bodies? Oh yes, Amen. Yes, yeah, so I believe. Yes, yeah, yeah, so I believe verse four is is, is the body of resurrection. Okay, it's the bodily resurrection yeah. of his saints. Okay, yes. will these bodies live? Um, will these be the bodies they live in during the millennium? And for eternity too. And for eternity too. Yeah. Will unbelievers go into the millennium without glorified bodies? Um. Yeah. So that uh, that is a good question. I'm I'm still working the, uh, this out. I would say, yeah. As of now, my position is yes. I will okay. say though too. Is that this doesn't discredit premillennialism because premillennialists disagree on this? No, that's that. That doesn't mean it doesn't discredit it. That just means you're all wrong. <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, brother, come on! <laughs> no, no, no. Just, uh, <laughs> that was not a question. I recant. No, no. I, re- I, I, I will put sackcloth and ashes on later. No, this. There, is well, let me say this then. Uh, there's nothing contradictory with saying either position of a premillennialist, whether it's going to be glorified bodies or not, there's nothing contradictory. The model can work with both. Do it. Do unbelievers receive glorified bodies? No. Yes. Or unbelievers no? don't receive glorified bodies. Okay. Unbelievers don't receive glorified yeah. bodies. So there will be death in the millennium. As of now, I would say yes. Yes. Will there be childbirth in the millennium? Oh yeah. Will this be for believers or unbelievers? Well, I believe that those who enter will most likely all be believers, but you know there would be some unbelievers mixed in there. And will there be mixed marriages between glorified and unglorified bodies? Oh no. Okay. Um, will believers be able to have children? I, I just asked you this: Will believers be able to have children? If so, are those children being born in glorified bodies? Oh no, no. I mean, no. Okay. Unless you're getting baptized, I'm joking. All right. You agree that there's physical death in the millennium, or you said you didn't know? As of now, I say yes. Okay. Seems to me there would have to be. Well, I can't. That's not a question. Let me say <laughs> because there's a final battle, right? So in the final battle, will people die? Yeah. Yes. Correct. Okay. So there has to be death, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. All right. So how do you interpret Paul's words then when he says that at the return of Christ, death will be swallowed up in victory? When you're 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 conceding that there will be another thousand years of death and suffering after the return of Christ, so we're going after so we're going out of Revelation nineteen and 20, uh, 20 now. This no, is but this is the, but, but again, you keep doing. That. I'm I'm going to ask you this question. Well, is, I'm not, is, I'm is, it wrong, is it wrong to ask a question about the the end times from on on a same topic? We're not doing John three sixteen and Romans nine here. It's the same topic. Well, no. Well, the the similarity I gave between John three sixteen is talking about God's love, with Romans nine thirteen. 
So yeah. it is a similarity. So, so you know, again, I'm saying J James White would chew you out for this, brother. Well, I'll uh, call him and ask him when we're done. But let's. let's... <laughs> uh, that'd be fun. Uh, which verse in First Corinthians, though, uh, do you want to talk about? Is it verse fifty or verse? Uh... Um, actually, I the, the, just the citation that death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where's your sting? Oh, death, where's your victory? That when Christ returns, death is no more. Do you disagree with that? No, no. So I, yeah. So uh, if, if you want to know my view on first Corinthians 15, which is, we, you know, again, this is totally off topic here. I believe in verse 24 of first Corinthians 15, the end comes after Christ comes when he hands, he, he delivers the kingdom to God, the father. So he says in verse 24, first Corinthians, then comes the end. And in verse 23, he came. So Christ came, then the end comes when he hands over the kingdom to God, the father, not when he comes. Okay, so so you're you're inter interjecting a thousand year period in that then, I believe just like Lada and tons of tons of premillen. I mean, I don't know any premillens who, who disagrees with me on that. That there that there is a possible or uh, order of events here that is even if you don't say it's a thousand years, there's an indefinite period of time here because Christ comes in verse twenty three. He says, "Be each in his own order." Christ the first fruits. After those who are Christ at his coming, he comes. Verse twenty four. Then comes the end. So the end comes not in verse 23, but verse 24, when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, when he has abolished all rule and authority and power. That's when the end comes, according to Paul. It's after Christ comes. And it's an indefinite period of time, whether it's a thousand or more or even a hundred years, there's a clear gap or indefinite, undefined period going on between those two verses. So if I asked you where you find the gap between the return of Christ and the defeat of death, that's where your answer would be. And then I would also point out too, in verse 24, uh, the Greek word, I can't pronounce it, but the word, the Greek word for then is the same word for, for seven, where Paul says, he speaks about an order of events, Christ after his resurrection, he says, he appeared to more than 500 brethren. And then in verse seven, then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. So Paul uses then to indicate sequence in historical time. So there's clearly a, a, a chronology going on here. And I'm saying he's doing this in verses 23 and 24, which allows for a period to exist. Okay, that, that was my question, the, the, the gap. Um, will there be sin happening during the millennial reign? Yes, that, that's my position as of now. Will there be salvation for unbelievers offered during the millennial reign? Yeah, correct. Uh, that would follow. Okay. Um, if the believer became or if the unbeliever became saved during the millennial reign, would he receive his glorified body then, or would he die normally? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, I I would say that that he would. Uh, you know, I, I mean, I'm I'm going to go back to First Corinthians now, doing what I don't want to do. But I would. Hey, it's I okay. Say, I, I I open the door. <laughs> run back to First Corinthians. That way, I'll I break it, yeah, 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 we'll break my own rule. Right together, and he can spank <laughs> us both. Um. I yeah. I uh. Yes to to the answer to your question. Okay. Um. So what is, is the millennium our blessed hope or is the eternal state our blessed hope? I would say Christ. So Titus 2.13, looking for the, uh, what does he say? I'm, I'm going off of memory here. The blessed hope is Christ's return. It's Christ himself. Like, like John 17.3, this is eternal life. What? To know thee, the only true God, Jesus Christ, whom thou sent. Okay, so he is our blessed hope. His return is our blessed hope. But our blessed hope is tied to a thousand year reign of him on the earth that includes the continuation of death, disease, and destruction. Um, well, uh, it, it was verse 13 of Titus 2. He goes, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of a great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So he's our blessed hope. And then your second part was. In reference okay, to so my, my question, I, I believe I, I, I agree with you that Christ is our blessed hope. Yeah. But if it is our blessed hope in his in his coming, his return is is his return then preceded or does his return precede a thousand year period where death, disease and destruction still reign on the earth? So there's going to be sin, but it's going to be uncommon. Like Isaiah 65, 20 talks about how a child will die at 100 years and be thought long. But I would also say this too, though, Keith, and that's what I said in my rebuttal, your alternative is even worse. Your alternative includes 65 million aborted babies and LGBT groomers. You're saying we're in the millennial now. That's the, your view is even worse than mine, exponentially. 
But my view is, again, a spiritual kingdom that is now, that is a church militant that's battling that, where your view is Christ is here. He's already vanquished. My question, because I know I got to form this as a question and not a statement. Okay. My question to you is, how is my view worse if you're saying that Christ is here, has defeated death, as all these things have happened, and yet it's still death and sin and disease and destruction are still here? So when Christ comes, I think you agree with me, him putting down and ending abortion and groomers, dry cream story hour, fraudulent elections, all this nonsense, hallelujah, that is so much better than this present age, which is saying that this is the millennial now. When Isaiah talks about the lion drawing with the with the lamb, the beating their plowshare, uh, the weapons into plowshares, that's the millennial kingdom. I don't want to water that down and say, oh, by the way, it includes Joe Biden's presidency and it you know, includes you know, Kamala Harris trying to kill Trump. Like th that, that, that's horrible. Is there a point in the millennium where someone's going to look to someone else and say, man, this started good, but it seems to be getting worse? In the millennial? I wouldn't say so. So, I mean, I think to, uh, but when uh, Satan's loose for a season, isn't yeah, that exactly going to make things about. worse? Are they going to look around and say, hey, this started good, but it just isn't going anywhere? I think it's going to be rather short, and I do think that uh, the nations that Satan deceives includes the, the resurrection of the dead, because they happen simultaneously. And John Gill, by the way, actually agrees with me on this. And Thomas Schreiner, too. If the millennial state is our, as I would see, is, is, is our final abode, and Christ's uh, teaching on this is that we go from this state to that state. What is the purpose of the millennial kingdom? What is its ultimate telos? Yeah, it's a great question. So Christ is a, is the last Adam. So that, you know, Adam was promised dominion. Christ will fulfill that. Adam lived to 100 to 930 years. Christ as a second Adam will live to a thousand years. The only man, or, or sorry, reigned for a thousand years. The only man that reigned for 1000 years, he'll fulfill those promises. He's the son of Abraham the son of David, what, uh, he fulfills the Abrahamic covenant, a land promises, a blessing all the nations. He fulfills the, the Davidic covenant, reigning, you know, the, the, the eternal son that God promised. So reigning from Israel over all the nations, ruling them with a rod of iron. All these things Christ will fulfill, proving he's the Messiah. And, and it'll be a glorious thing to, to be a part of that. I look forward to being there with you, Keith, too. Okay. Well, <laughs> I, praise the Lord. Uh, <laughs> Uh, in the event or in, in that question, I want to ask about the the eternal state, the the question of what you just said. OK, this is the inner or, or would, would you would you agree with me that the millennium is a um, is an inter uh, objection between this age and the age to come? Um, I believe well, is it the age to come? Gotcha. Yeah. I believe it's a part of this age and it's a first initiation to the new creation. Okay. So the millennium is still this age. Correct. So Christ returns and he sets up his kingdom, but it's still this age. Correct. Yeah. And, and you know, I just use language to the first initiation of, of the new age. So, you know, you, so I it's, need... so it is, a, it is an intermediate age. It's a dispensation within this age. So, so you could, yeah, within the, and not dispensationalism, by the way. I'm not a dispensationalist. I mean, so dispensation just a period of time. Your foot shall slip in due time. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. That's okay. <laughs> okay. So the, the, the point I'm making is uh, is the, the promise of Christ's reign and all of these things and his return. Uh, how is that not the eternal state? How is how does Christ, if we consider the four, the four overall parts of the meta narrative of scripture, which are creation, fall, redemption, and restoration. So you're saying restoration has a multifaceted uh, schedule, I guess is the, the word I'd find. The, uh, there's a structure to things. God, you know, um, if you zoom out, you can see, okay, this is what God is going to do. You zoom in, there, there's structure, there's order. Like even First Corinthians 15, the end comes after Christ returns. So clearly, you know, again, like whether you interpret that as a thousand years or even a day or even an hour, there's some kind of period of time going on between there. So the end comes when Christ delivers the kingdom of God, the father, not when he returns, Paul says. Okay. Um, in Romans, again, I know you don't like this. I, 
<laughs> I can to... tell you're like feeling the tension to quote those verses. <laughs> well, I have a, I, I have a whole list that I didn't do. I just I'm, I'm my, my because you're you're you seem to be averse to wanting to answer questions. Well, I, I, I don't want to poison the well. I'm not averse to it. Like I do, I, I do do broad debate subjects, but just in in relation to this, and I would just point this as a as a weakness of the Amil who can't interpret these two chapters without telescoping from other portions of Scripture. You should be able to walk through these chapters and prove to me your position. If you can't, that shows a weakness. I'm going to try to form this as a question. How is it when I gave you a exe exegesis of the text, even though you disagree, how are you saying I didn't deal with the text in my opening statement when I gave a three-part mm. exegesis, giving the the binding, the blessing, and the battle? At least, I mean, I did it as any good Baptist would. What? How, how have I not dealt with the text? It, 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 because I've answered your questions, even though you're not satisfied with my answers. How? Where was I in error? Now, I'm, I'm taking I, I, you out of the text, but I, I where did I not fulfill the the requirements of the debate. Gotcha. And um, I just want to make sure, you know, clear, um, I do respect you, you know, Brother Keith. So, you know, I hope this doesn't come across like, you know, Lucas is just trying to be mean towards him. So I sincerely, you know, respect you as a brother in Christ. I think you made a lot of claims and you talked about progressive parallelism and you threw a lot of problems at the text, but you didn't give a firm and consistent exegesis walking us through this chapter verse by verse. Okay. And, and that's what, is expected in 20 minute opening statement absolutely yeah okay all right Ex exegesis so um i think theology should be dictated by exegesis rather than dictating exegesis by our system so i want to be exegetical in all that i believe and draw it out from the text no i agree and i believe i did i believe i walked through the text i gave an answer for what the text says and i believe again following james white's example I took you from the beginning of the text to the end of the text and gave you an understanding of, of my position. But again, that's not a question, so I'm breaking the rules. In Romans 8, 18 to 25, it indicates that creation longs for the return of Christ because it desires restoration. When Christ returns, will the world be restored? It's going to be, so the, again, if you zoom out, like, like this is what God is going to do. You zoom in, there, there's a structure to it. So the same, so, you know, this is Paul here and too, who wrote 1 Corinthians 15. But Again, there's going to be a structure to, way, to to the reason or to the ways that God does things. So Christ comes, he will, you know, the lion will dwell with the lamb. The nations will beat their weapons into plowshares. But you also have Isaiah 65, 20, how there's going to be a child who, who if he dies at 100 years, he'll be thought young and accursed. So okay, both, you're not both allowed both to go to other true. passages, remember? Well, you're making me do it. <laughs> you're making me do it, Keith. <laughs> All right. So the, the point I'm making is during the millennium, will there be earthquakes, floods, uh, drought, uh, tsunamis and hurricanes? No, uh, I'm not an amillennialist. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm not an amillennialist. So I don't believe during the millennial there will be earthquakes, droughts and tsunamis. You believe that, not me. No, oh, yeah, no, I, I, no, I do because I believe that. Yeah, so I'm not. Yes, yeah, so I don't believe that. No, 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 no. But I'm asking you during the millennium when Christ is here, will those things be occurring? Oh, as a premillennialist, no, I don't believe that. Okay. That'll be that, that's yeah. all right. So it's a it's a it's a world that's restored, but not completely. Yeah, like uh, and again, it's a the first stage or the initiation to this, but the end comes after he puts down all rule and authority and power, and when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father. Okay, I have one final question. I know we're about out of time, Donnie. So thank you. Uh, okay. This is uh, something I ask in a lot of debates if I have time. And I do, so I'll ask you. Awesome. What was my best argument? Your best argument um, when you went outside of Revelation. I, no, I'm joking. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. I would have to re to recap. Um, I probably think you you probably could have questioned me more on the wars. I'm surprised that uh, that you didn't. I think that's one good Amil argument that uh, that they have. Where on what? I didn't hear you. The wars um, on on the wars in chapter 16, 19, and 20 were. Where okay. John typically uses, you know, similar phrases. I think that's a powerful Amel argument that they offer. Okay, that was it. Yeah. All right, gentlemen. Very thought-provoking 50-minute cross-examination. You guys had me right into it, enjoying the back and forth. And it's like you guys have done this before. You knew to ask question after question. You guys understand the rules. And as a result, you gave me a very easy job as a moderator tonight. So Keith, Lucas, my brothers, appreciate the excellent and cordial cross-examination. So with that, we have concluding statements. So this is a good 
opportunity to wrap up our thoughts, wrap up our points, and address anything in terms of arguments and points that we feel may have been left hanging. Now, Lucas is in the affirmative. So, Keith, we're going to give you the first concluding statement. And again, you got five minutes. Go ahead, Keith. All right. <clears throat> The problem with the premillennial view, which assumes the continuation of chapter 19 into chapter 20 and forces Christ's return to precede a millennial kingdom on the earth, the problem with that view is, is it forces an intermediate, unnecessary interjection in between this age and the age to come. It presumes that the promises to Israel were not fulfilled in the church, but have been postponed to some future state of being, which is in the intermediate between this age and the age to come, something the Bible never teaches. Now, Lucas didn't say that, so I just want to say that's what a lot of people who believe in premillennial view understand, so I don't want to, uh, don't want to put that on to him. Never does Jesus say in this age, in the millennium, and in the age to come, it's always constructed as this age and the age to come. There's nothing intermediate. There's nothing in between. There's nothing to look forward to that will separate this age and the age to come. When I interpret Revelation 20, I'm interpreting it by comparing Scripture with Scripture. And since there's nothing else in Scripture that would indicate this thousand-year interruption, a question that I really didn't get to ask, and that's the question of, is, is there anywhere else in Scripture where this uh, millennium comes up? Uh, because there isn't, I'm, I'm forced to interpret the millennium in light of other much clearer passages. If you hold your premillennial view, you must believe that physical death continues after the return of Christ. So death is not defeated at the return of Christ, which to me is in direct contradiction to Paul's words in 1 Corinthians 15, where he says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we shall all be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Other than, a, other than with a particular reading of Revelation 20, there's nowhere you will find a gap between the return of Christ and the defeat of death, even though we saw one try to be introduced. The reason is, um, or rather, this is reason enough to say that those who hold to a premillennial view should reconsider how they understand Revelation chapter 20. The practical problem for premillennialism is that we're never called to hope for another age of already and not yet. That's where we are now. We're not looking for that. In premillennialism, Christ is here, his kingdom is here, but it's still not yet. We're still not yet in the eternal state. It's at best closer, but not complete. I think given the choice, we'd all want to skip and go right into the new earth. Now, I realize our choices don't make reality, but it's something to consider when we think about the desire God has put in the believer. We don't have a desire for an intermediate kingdom. God has put a desire in the hearts of his people that death and sin and all of that that goes with it will be destruct, destroyed when Christ returns. It will no longer affect the new heaven and the new earth. We desire the final eternal state promised by Christ where sin and death will be no more. This is what the parables teach. This is what the epistles teach. Therefore, this is how we ought to interpret Revelation 20, 1 through 10. I believe the millennium is now, the kingdom is now, already, but not yet. The not yet is that the eternal state is coming, not another millennium where we're still de dealing with death, disease, and destruction, but an, a kingdom which will have no end, and there will be done away with death, disease, and destruction. Our blessed hope is that while we expect Satan to be released for a season, we know that when Christ returns, Satan will be vanquished. The eternal state will begin. So we say, Maranatha, come, Lord Jesus. Thank you. Thank you, Keith, for that five-minute concluding statement. I appreciate it. Lucas, we'll now hand it over to you. And you also have five minutes. The floor is yours. Over the recent years, I've been seriously studying eschatology. And what started me on this journey are the many attacks and rhetoric against premillennialism. So I wanted to give it a defense of the, what 
is the historic earliest belief regarding the millennial. And this journey has led me into dealing with all sorts of arguments from all sorts of views. But out of them all, I must say, amillennialism has one of the strongest. For you know, uh, and to compare this compared to neo postmillennialism, that's what I call a modified version of historic postmillennialism. They offer little exegesis and much rhetoric, and their arguments feel forced to artificial interpretation, so it fits into their eighty seventy paradigm. And the reason why I mention this is that unlike them, a good amill recognizes that our theology must be determined by exegesis and not by a commitment to a theological system. So preparing for this debate, I was glad to really lock arms with their arguments, and through it, I was even able to learn more about this topic as they taught me things about the book of Revelation. So for that, I, I am grateful, and I hope my opening statement showed my respect by dealing with their arguments. So I'm not thinking of viewing the uh, the, the Amils or my Amil brothers as these unintelligent men who aren't doing exegesis and aren't attempting to deal and struggle with, with the text. So I, so I just really wanted to be clear that Amils have one of the best arguments for the millennial kingdom. Nevertheless, there is a second, and premillennialism is first. So the Amil, though clever and intelligent, is ultimately not satisfying to the text of Scripture, and I believe that this debate demonstrated that. There's issues and problems here that weren't really being addressed. Address. One of them was there, Keith seems to be allowing for, even if there is chronology, I'm not wrong still. Well, that's not true. If you talk to a good amillennial scholar like Anthony Hokema, he'll admit that there is. We're virtually compelled to be premillennialist. And I know just because, you know, common nowadays, preterist and post mills don't really interpret these two as, chron as chronological. doesn't mean that you can go, go down that route. I mean, what, what else are we debating tonight? As, as I showed, there is a consistency of ands being used chronological and there's exegetical problems such as the binding of Satan. Satan is not bound now. I think it's hard to say and look around at, um, at the world and think that no nation right now on this earth is deceived by Satan. So, what, so what's the conclusion there? Even our experience tells us that Satan isn't bound. And he's in the abyss. Revelation 9 talks about the abyss there. Keith says pro probably or maybe not. You know, he has to do a little bit more studying. You can compare it. The abyss there locks demons away. When it's open, they come out. In chapter 20, Satan is thrown into that. The door is shut and sealed. You go into chapter or verse 4 of chapter 20, more exegetical problems. There's somehow two types of resurrections there. When John clearly says one group comes to life here. The other group comes to life after the millennial. Clearly, John is saying the same resurrection happens to both of them. The difference is just times. It's a bodily resurrection. John even uses that same phrase in chapter 2 or verse 8 of Christ. And the only resurrection the Bible speaks of that, that happens to Christians after they die. I'm talking about after they die, not before. Yes, there is a spiritual resurrection of regeneration, of reigning with Christ now. But in chapter of 20 of Revelation of verse 4, the saints there, they're already Christians and they're already bodily dead. And then John says they come to life. What is that coming to life that happens after we die? The Bible tells us it's a bodily resurrection, the same resurrection that happened to Christ. Furthermore, I also want to you know mention some things that were brought up tonight, how premillennialists still are saying that there is a imperfect reign of Christ on the earth. Listen, what's the opposite? To say that we're, that we're in the millennial now is to say that when Isaiah, and I talked about this during my cross-examination period by Brother Keith, when Isaiah, the prophet, spoke of the lion dwelling with the lamb and the nations worshiping Christ and beating the weapons and the plowshares, that actually means that 65 million plus aborted babies are, are dead and it keeps on climbing. That actually means that we have drag queen story hour. That actually means that we have LGBT grooming going on. All these things, fraudulent um, elections. When Christ comes, no way will it be like that. He's going to end all this, and he's going to do what John says in Revelation 19, rule them with a rod of iron. And unlike all the men in the Bible who never made it to a thousand year reign, Christ, the second Adam, will make it to a thousand years. The first Adam died at 930 years. Christ, the second Adam, will reign for a thousand years. Jesus, the Messiah, will make it, and he will rule, rule them with a rod of iron. And let all the praise and glory be to the King of the Millennial, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Brother Keith, for this debate. It's really honored to, to share this with you, and um, I, you know, I respect you for doing this. And I hope that I was able to be respectful to you. And thank you to Donnie for hosting us, and to the audience for tuning in. God bless. Thank you, Lucas. It's my pleasure, gentlemen. I appreciate the concluding statements, and that was an excellent war for the Millennium. Right up there with 
the war for the one ring i would say which <laughs> if you're familiar with that trilogy is pretty epic so you guys <laughs> did not let us down lucas and keith epic showdown i appreciate it brothers okay well we've had a very engaged chat and some excellent questions have come in for us to interact with. So let's get into some audience questions. Gentlemen, what we typically do in terms of format for our audience Q&A is whoever the question is for, just so we can move along smoothly from question to question, is whoever the question's for gets the last word. So uh, Keith, let's say the question's for you, you get to respond. Lucas, you can have a response as well, provide a rebuttal, however you'd like to do. And then we throw it back to Keith for a quick final word. And so, okay, let's start right at the beginning. We've had questions come in all the way through. So if it's a question pertaining to something you gentlemen already answered or responded to, I apologize, but this gives us the opportunity to elaborate <clears throat> on certain points. So here we go. Psalm 19.1. Appreciate the question. Question for Lucas. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ. Revelation 1, verse 9. How can John be in the kingdom if it doesn't exist yet? So, so I believe the kingdom does exist now. So I'm not a classical dispensationalist because I think some some new dispensationalists would would probably say there isn't already not yet but I believe the kingdom does exist now there's just going to be a final consummation and the millennial reign is a dispensational rule now, I'm not dispensationalist but a dispensation is a period of time reign of of Christ and even all mills and post mills agree that there's an unfulfilled aspect to God's kingdom so there's this already not yet so we're reigning with Christ now we are priests as he says in chapter one and you go to chapter five John also says they will reign upon the earth. So John is teaching both a current reign, a spiritual reign, and then a physical reign. They will reign upon the earth. And that happens in chapter 20 after Christ returns. Do I have one minute you said to respond to that? Uh, is that what it is? I would say somewhere between okay. a minute and two. Go that, 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 that's fine. We're not long. too strict here. Um, so if there's if there's something else you wanted to add? or no, was you... I just want to make okay. sure I didn't go. I appreciate it, Lucas. Very good. Keith, the floor is yours. Go ahead. No, I understand the heart of the question, and I, I I anticipated Lucas's answer based on things that he has that he said in the debate, and that is that he believes that the kingdom is here in an already not yet uh, uh, for, form. Uh, I just think the not yet is the is not the millennium, but the not yet is the uh, the return of Christ, which in, in institutes the eternal state. So that's that's where we would differ on that. But we both believe in some form the kingdom is here. I would probably say I maybe believe that it's here more than he does in, in one sense. Uh, but uh, the rule and reign of Christ is happening here in Lucas, and I both affirm that. Thank you very much, Keith. Lucas, if you'd like to, you can have a final word. Question was for you. Oh, okay. Um, I didn't find too much I disagreed with with Keith on that. I mean, he acknowledged that we both believe in already not yet. So, you know, uh, I would just amen that with him and not have too much tension with that. Okay, very good. Appreciate it. Next question comes in from Josh C., question now for you, Keith. How does Satan being bound correlate with Ephesians 2 verse 2 when Paul suggests Satan is working in the sons of disobedience in 2 Corinthians 4, 4, the God of this world? Well, again, as I said uh, in my statement, the binding is limited by the context of Revelation 20, where it says bound not to deceive the nations. The gospel is going out to the nations and people are believing from every tribe and tongue and people. And we see that through the work of missions. We see that through the work of evangelists going out. And it has been happening ever since the beginning of the church. And this is the picture of the, the seed, you know, the mustard seed produces this big tree the the um the 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 leaven leavens the whole lump and the, the reason why is is, is it, it it works over time and the this binding God, Christ is crushing Satan under our feet according to uh, uh, Romans 16 19 so yes I do think that Satan is at work I think I think he is uh, a roaring lion seeking whom he, he may devour, that is true. But through the proclamation of the gospel, there is an active and continual binding of Satan that is happening, the same that happened when the 72 went out and preached in Luke's gospel. And Jesus said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. 
uh, at the preaching of the gospel. And so I, I, I see that as, again, it, it is a spiritual or not spiritual, but a symbolic understanding of the binding, but that's the way I understand it. Thank you very much, Keith. Lucas, over to you. Yeah, so the purpose clause in Revelation so uh, of Satan's binding is so he won't deceive the nations. But what's dependent upon that purpose clause is where Satan is, so the location. He's in the abyss. So it's not just he has a chain. He's not a dog on, on a leash. He has a chain. He's thrown into the abyss. The door is closed and then it's shut. And the abyss is hindering. It's, it's a prison cell. So obviously Ephesians is not you know, uh, consistent with, uh, with that reading where, yeah, it's, it uses this strong, uh, symbolic language, which by the way, there are many literal things in verses one through three of revelation 20, the nation's literal, the heaven is literal. Earth is literal. The, uh, you know, Satan is, is, is literal. So yes, it uses symbolic language. If it's not meant to obfuscate truth, it's to reveal truth. And where is Satan? He's, he's locked away in chapter 20. He's clearly not in locked away in Ephesians. He, he's roaming the air. He's working in the sons of disobedience. Thank you, Lucas. Keith, you get the last word. Go ahead. Again, I think the the overall uh, litmus test of Revelation is when we look at the subject of how do we understand things symbolically rather than woodenly, literally. And when we talk about doors and chains and keys and things like this, I think we're imposing a wooden literalism onto the text that isn't intended to be there. Appreciate it, Keith. Okay, next question now for you, Lucas Curcio. Paul Anker, appreciate the question here, Paul. Will the gospel be preached and people be saved by it during the millennium? If so, what is the fundamental difference between now and this future time? The, yeah, the gospel will uh, will be preached even in, in eternity. I think we're always going to remember the gospel and praise praise Christ, you know, uh, you know uh, because of it. And I do believe that if the unresurrected bodies and there's children, that those children would would at some point come to faith in Christ, and there will be even some unbelievers, even if it's just hard um, hard to tell. I don't see. I don't understand. So uh, the last part of the question: If so, what is the fundamental difference between now and this future time? Um, I guess I'll answer this by saying Christ being on the earth, ruling a, as a monarch from Israel over all the nations, ruling them with a rod of iron. And you can see that even in the prophets Zechariah, Isaiah, there's still sin involved. It's not going to be the the norm, but there will be exceptions. But you know, the difference will be Christ is here, and that's going to be all the difference in the world, and that'll be so much better. Thank you very much, Lucas, Keith. Floor is yours. Go ahead. Um, I think the 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 people being saved during the millennium, as I said in my my um, conversation in the the cross examination, is is part of the problem because what happens the the question of what happens to these people when you when you really begin to examine premillennialism and you begin to ask these questions, you know what's the difference? I think, I think that's when the, the issues really raise. And, and I understand Lucas and I would disagree on that, but that's, this is the heart of it. You know, can people be saved? Will they be saved? Will they receive glorified bodies? Then will they die? Will they not die? I think these are all questions that have to be considered, uh, even though one would say, well, we just don't know the answer. Okay. But this is presenting some pretty serious problems. And that's what the question is trying to get to. Thank so you, Keith. Say, yeah, Lucas, go ahead. Oh, thank you. Sorry. Yeah, so I would just say, uh, just because there are different views doesn't and or problems, as you say, doesn't mean that it's inconsistent. I mean, uh, you even acknowledge in, in certain cases that there might be chronology between these two chapters. So if if you can say things like that, I can say, well, this might be this way, this might be that way. We don't know on, on everything. We're not claiming we know on everything. We're just saying certain things are clear. And the text of scripture, we believe is clear. Christ comes before the millennial which means that the thousand years follow after he returns, not before it or concurrent with his spiritual reign now. Thank you, Lucas. Appreciate it. Okay, so this next question looks like it's just a question for the both of you. So no one really specific. So we'll get one response each. Lucas, why don't we start with you since you got the last word on the last question. This way, Keith can get the second response. So here we go. Uh, question for the debaters. Was the end... Was the end was in reference to Israel in the Old Covenant? If so, why should anyone extend the end beyond the end of the temple sacrifices? Yes, yeah, so I believe that Matthew, uh, I think he's referencing maybe like the Olivet Discourse. I believe Matthew 24 is a double fulfillment. So there's, mo there's it's, it's kind of hard to tell sometimes with the double fulfillment of what's going on, but Christ talking about both AD 70 and also beyond that. Um, I did a debate recently on this preterism versus futurism on my channel. 
Uh, so I do believe that, that there's a, a double fulfillment. So there was an end of the Old Testament age, but there's also an end of this age, which Christ and even Amel brothers agree with of, in their two kingdom or two age model, this age and the age to come. So um, I hope that answers uh, the question. Appreciate it, Lucas. Keith, over to you. Um, I hate. I know this breaks the rules. What was your position? You said preter partial preterism could be true based on your position, Lucas? Oh, I'm definitely not a partial preterist. No, I'm, I'm a futurist who just holds that to a double fulfillment of Matthew 24. Oh, Matthew 24, but not Revelation. Okay, that that was that was yeah. uh, okay. So that that was all okay. So, but you think this is in reference to the end, re referring to Matthew 24? I think. Well, I mean, he's probably maybe th thinking about First Corinthians too, where there's, Paul talks about the end of the ages. But I, but I would imagine he was pro pro probably primarily dealing with the all of a discourse. Yeah, I'm just trying to figure out the the heart of the question. I'm sorry, Donnie. I, I don't that's mean to be interject. No, that's okay. <laughs> just want to make sure. Yeah, was the end was in reference to Israel and the old covenant? Like the end of the age, I would say in Matthew 24, he's probably asking maybe. Well, it there almost sounds like he's coming from a full preterist viewpoint. I could yeah. be wrong about that, but it kind of sounds because you know the full preterist looks yeah. to the end of the age as being the end of the old covenant. Now we're in the new covenant, aka the new heaven, new earth. What maybe re maybe referencing what I said when I talked about this age and the age to come. Some mm. sometimes there is a reference that could be the age, the old covenant age, and the age to come being the new covenant age. There are some who interpret that that phraseology that way. And if that's the case, there I think there may be a few passages that could lend itself to that. But overall, when we hear about this age and the age to come, I believe it's referring to this age as being the age prior to Christ's second coming, and then. Oh, I am full predators. He just said, yeah. Okay. So he had confirmed. All right. So, uh, yeah, I just don't agree with you, <laughs> but, I, <laughs> so, but as far as the, this age and the age to come, the predators would, I think predators would say this age and the age to come is the old covenant, new covenant where, um, and, and I think that might fit in some context, but in regard to what I was saying today, I think in, re in reference to this age being the age prior to Christ's uh, return and consummation and the age to come being the eternal state. So, okay. Appreciate the responses, gentlemen. And there's some agreeance there with you both, uh, Lucas and Keith on the nature of full preterism. Okay. Next question comes in from Ray Sodder question for you now, Lucas, when would the tribulation slash millennial saints receive their glorified bodies or do they? Yeah, so e easy question. When Christ returns, is that's, that's when uh, we will receive our glorified bodies after the second coming of Christ. Or, uh, is that the question? When will the tribulation? I, I, I think he know? means um, during oh, the millennium. If yeah, you, I just, you know what? The, the word tribulation threw me off. The millennial <laughs> saints. Yes, okay, gotcha. So that, that would be at, uh, in verse 50, I believe, going off in memory of 1 Corinthians fi uh, 15. After Christ abolishes everything, the last enemy that will be defeated is death. And so that would when in, in that question, uh, that would win. They would receive the glorified bodies. OK, thank you, Lucas. Keith, any thoughts? Um, well, the the the, the amillennial answer, the simple answer is that the glorified bodies are, are received when Christ returns. That's the that's what some people call the rapture. We believe it is in, is concurrent with Christ returns. We are raptured with glorified bodies. Christ returns with his saints because we caught up to meet him together in the clouds. We return with him in the same way the Roman processional was done, where those in the city would go out to meet the king and bring him in. And 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 that's the picture of First Thessalonians 4. And therefore, um, that's when they would receive their glorified bodies. If Lucas is correct and there's a millennial kingdom after that, they would be going into the millennium with their glorified bodies. Um, but if my position is correct, they would be going into the eternal state with their glorified bodies. Either way, the glorified bodies would come there. The question would be what happens after that? If there's a millennial reign that's on this earth, will they have babies? Will they procreate? Will they, that, that's the questions that I was raising earlier. But as far as the timing of the glorified bodies, I think we both would agree. Okay. Appreciate it, Keith. Lucas, you can have the last word if you'd like. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we agree in terms of when when Christ comes, is there is a resurrection. But as a premillennialist, you know, as Keith, you know, pointed out, you know, there's some nuances, you know, between us of when, in re in reference to this question, when the millennial saints, you know, receive the glorified bodies. And I would just again, just to reiterate, I think the end comes in verse 24, of 4 Corinthians 15. You know, I, I need to clarify something. I actually, oh. I read the question wrong because I was listening and reading. They were talking about people who become saints during the millennium. 
Gotcha. So my, so my answer did not answer their question. I apologize. That's my mistake. I just misunderstood the question. So. Okay. If you want to re-answer, you can. And No, I, that, I would say that's one of the questions I asked you was if people are saved during the millennium, when do they receive their glorified bodies? And we talked about that during cross X. So I, I don't need to ask it again. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. So I would just say after uh, verse 24 for 1 Corinthians, then comes the end when, when he delivers up the kingdom of God, the father, when he has abolished all rule and authority and power. And then he goes on to talk about how the last enemy is death. So that would be when. Okay. Thank you very much for the final word there, Lucas. <clears throat> Next question comes in for Keith from underground publishing. Please ask Keith to exegete Isaiah 19, 18 to 25. In two minutes? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's fair. When did Egypt speak the language of Canaan and swear to the Lord and Egypt and Assyria become one nation with Israel? Keith, you got an hour. We'll give you an hour. I'm, I'm going to fill on this question, too. <laughs> huh? I'm going to fill on this question, too. <laughs> Power no, exegesis. <laughs> but the, the heart of the question, I think, is, and, and I'm not going to give a, I'm not going to try to exegete that passage in this short amount of time, but I think the heart of the question is, what do you do with these passages that give promises of things that we don't believe have been fulfilled? And this comes down to the issue of the question of the promises that are given into the Old Testament. Are there promises in the Old Testament that have, have not been fulfilled in Christ? And if they're not fulfilled in Christ, do we have to have a future kingdom for them to be fulfilled in? And while I would say there are passages that are difficult to fit within that paradigm, I do believe that all of the promises to Israel are fulfilled in Christ. And therefore, these promises of this of this that, that are referenced in the in the passage there uh, and others would have a fulfillment in Christ, even though we may not understand them now, much like the this is what I said in my opening statement. Maybe this will clarify what I was saying, Lucas, when I said my opening statement, I was talking about the Pharisees and Sadducees. The Pharisees and the Sadducees misunderstood Christ's first coming for many reasons, but not the least of which is because they had an already understood understanding of what the Messiah was going to be. And when Christ wasn't what they thought he should be, they immediately rejected him. And my point is, when we come to passages like this, we say, well, this is how this must be fulfilled. Therefore, that's why we have to have this millennial kingdom to fulfill this. And that's what, not what Lucas said, but that's kind of the heart of this question is, well, they, there are these things that have to be fulfilled. How Can we say these things have any fulfillment in the first coming of Christ and in the church age? I think we can. I think it might be difficult sometimes to fit those in, but I, I go back to 2 Corinthians. It says all the promises of God find their yes and amen in Christ. And Christ is the fulfillment of the promises given to Israel. He is, he is in fact, uh, true Israel. He is, and it, in him, we become children of Abraham. So that's that's my answer. Appreciate it, Keith. Lucas, over to you. Yeah, so I mean, it's a lot to unpack in in, in two minutes, so I'm not going to do it do it justice. But and I do agree with Keith that that the promises are fulfilled in Christ, but that doesn't negate a real corresponding to reality. Even go to Romans 11, Paul talks about in reference to Israel because he mentioned you know the the promises to Israel, such as in Isaiah, being fulfilled in Christ. It is, but there's still going to be a future re uh, restoration. So prophecies like this they will be fulfilled and i don't think we can call them problem pa passages it's not a, it's only a problem if you're an on mill if i'm a pre-mill yeah it's going to be fulfilled when christ comes back and reigns for a thousand years these things these things are really going to happen zachariah is going to happen isaiah you know 65 and and verses like this will actually happen appreciate it lucas and keith you get the last word because the question was for you go ahead no, I think that was fine. I think our, both of us gave our gave good answers. So I think that's that's enough. All right, very good. Keith, Lucas, appreciate it. Next one comes in from Pseudo Nim. $5 super chat. Appreciate the support for tonight's debate. And here's the question. Describe the battle of Gog and Magog based on either's position of Amil and Premil. An example is the Great White Throne chronological to wicked raised or pseudonymous pseudonymous and I'd, pseudonymous i'm not sure <laughs> they're using it correctly but uh, possibly uh, <laughs> you want me to go first or? yeah yeah yeah, Keith, yeah. Or you want we'll me have go you go first fine. I, 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 one final battle when Christ returns and he swallows up death and victory and destroys all. That's why I said chapter 16, chapter 20 in the end, or chapter 16, chapter 19, the end of chapter 20, all referencing the battle, the single battle again, uh, with the definite article. And so I would say it's all the same. I don't think there's multiple battles where Christ has to win and then win again and then win again. So appreciate it. Lucas thoughts. 
Yeah, I, I do agree with John Gill on this. And, and by the way, you you can read John Gill's commentary online. Uh, just Google it on, on Revelation. So, he was, so John Gill was a Baptist Calvinist. He, uh, he was a premillennialist. And he even believes that the Gog and Magog in, in Revelation and uh, 20 in reference to this question is an allusion to that battle. So I would probably say I do want to study this more, actually. And this digs into more, more of the Old Testament, which I have to just to study more on this. I want to find find out the different views on this and come to an exegetical conclusion on when that battle actually takes place. But I don't believe in Revelation. I think John is just alluding to this or, or as an illusion saying this is what is going to happen just like this battle. I don't think it's it's the same battle uh, of Gog and Magog uh, verbatim. John Gill also is afraid to use a period, if you've ever read. He, <laughs> he loves run-on sentences. He will use a, 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 a his sentences go forever. <laughs> That's my final word on that. <laughs> Appreciate it, gentlemen. I think this one's for you, Lucas. Michael C.A. If they are sequential, Revelation 19 to 20, how is the bride coming down? Then in Revelation 20, it goes back to Satan's binding. Uh, kind of an awkward question, or I don't know, I'm, I'm having some trouble, but I, I'll, I'll do my best. I'm assuming he's going to the earlier chapters of, of verses of chapter 19, where the bride is coming down. And I think that that symbolism, again, I'm not against symbolism, for the marriage supper, or what's going to take place when Christ returns with his bride, the church. So that would still follow a sequential order there with chapters 19 through 22. Thank you, Lucas. Keith, any thoughts on that one? I'm is if they're sequential, how is the bride coming down? Uh, I I mean I I don't believe they're sequential, so I I think that um, th there are things that are out of order, and I think that's uh, I I I'm not quite sure though what passage he's referencing. I wish there was a scripture that I could look at and say this is what I'm because I'm not quite sure which one. Lucas, what what what? Oh, you know what? Yeah, I, I, now, uh, now you said that. I'm thinking, is he going to chapter 21 with a new? That's why I was saying the bride yeah. comes down in chapter 21. Yeah, which would be uh, uh, if it chronologically would be after. Maybe uh, he's thinking about that. Yeah. So uh, you guys, uh, he has us both confused. Yeah, a little Man, bit. He should be debating yeah. us. <laughs> Maybe yeah. all three of yeah. us are a little confused. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here we go. Next question from Ray. It's for you, Keith. At what time will the house of Israel look upon him whom they have pierced? Uh, at his second coming. Okay. Short and sweet. Appreciate it, Lucas. Yeah. Amen. Add? When when Christ returns, that's when they'll look upon him whom they have pierced. Yeah. Okay. I'm sure there's more to the question, but that's the simple answer. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah. There, there, there. Are, I guess I could answer a little bit more. There, there are those who would say that Christ did return in judgment in AD 70. And so there's a preterist understanding of that that might be what the question is getting to, mm -hmm. or the question of the, the millennium, if it happens during the millennium, the Jews see Christ for who he truly is. And, you know, so, so there's a lot. I just think it's when Christ returns. I was going to say, though, Keith, that that is a non preteristic answer of you. That, I know. That's why I just gave. I just, I just fixed it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I get it. Yeah. yeah. You guys are good sports. I appreciate it. So this one, Mr. Bob G. Question for both. So maybe Lucas, we'll start with you this time for this one. What is at stake now if your opponent is wrong? Oh, your opponent is wrong, or uh, is okay? Um, I, I yeah. you think that'd be a bit if if I'm wrong. Yeah, I was I was kind no, of assuming no, that's how it'd if, be. I think he's saying if I'm wrong, Lucas, what what's the danger of me being wrong? Because you you believe you're right, I believe I'm right. If you believe oh, you're gotcha. right and I'm wrong, what's the danger of believing like I do? Gotcha. I don't. I, um, I definitely uh, do not think that Amalan Hills are heretics and not Christians. I think this is a secondary difference. You know, unless you're a full preterist, and I don't think you're. You, oh, I don't count you. I'm um, as a brother. No. Keith is not. So um, I definitely don't think it's it's a salvific one. I just want to be you know, just like Keith. You know, Keith wants to be faithful to the scriptures and we want to teach the whole counsel of God. So we, so we believe that these things, things matter. And especially, you know, Keith is, is a pastor um, and, you know, I have some online ministry. I'm not equivalent whatsoever to Keith. I'm, a, I'm just a layman. But again, I want to tell people the truth accurately and be consistent with that. So I, I would hope that I would do my best, honor and please the Lord and not say anything wrong that he's like, Lucas, you shouldn't have said this or done that and, and, and vice versa. Thank you, Lucas. Keith, what are your thoughts on that? I want to say amen and uh, what, you know, 
right away, I think this is definitely, I would even put this in the category of a tertiary, not even secondary, because I think the people within the same church maybe can hold to a view different on this and, 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 and still be brothers in Christ. And I certainly believe Lucas, that you are my brother in Christ. So, um, but I will say that there is, um, there is at least in the last hundred years, particularly with dispensational premillennialism, and this is not the position Lucas holds, but there has seemed to be a, um, a, and, a, and when I say this, I, I know I'm going to get slammed for it. So forgive me. Yeah, but yeah, I, I mean, uh, huh? I'll probably agree with you actually. No, 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 I'm saying, I'm saying from the audience made yeah. those who are, those who are dispensational are going to get upset when I say this, but there is, seems to be an inherent pessimism in dispensational premillennialism where, you know, we're just rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic and we need to, you know, don't worry about this. Just the millennium's coming. Right. Um, and I, and I do think that within, uh, uh, the post-millennial view, which I, I'm not proposing, but in the post-millennial view, there does seem to be an, an, an optimism that creates social concern, which creates movements towards those things, which I think are positive. And I think as an optimistic amillennialist, I can stand alongside many of them, even though I would disagree with some of their conclusions as to what's going to happen. So I think there, I think there are some things that can affect how we engage with the world and social concern and things like that. But it's, it's not leading me to say in any way that Lucas is an inferior Christian or Lucas is a, you know, or, or anything like that, or John MacArthur is an inferior Christian because he's dispensational premillennialist. I just think it might affect how we, how we operate socially, how we operate culturally, what we expect. And that would be the only thing that is at stake is perhaps some behavioral issues, but, but it's not going to change, um, you know, the position in Christ. So that would be, I think that answers the, the question. All right, brothers. Appreciate those well thought out responses to a good question. All right, here we go. Lucas Curcio comes in from Paul Anchor. Is the temple in the millennium for both Jews and Gentiles to worship? Why should it be necessary if Jesus can be worshipped without a temple as now? Okay, so this is where I'm not a dispensationalist. So as of now, I don't think there's going to be a return to the Mosaic ceremonial law in this. Now, I'm not going to say they're heretics for saying this. because I think people go too far because if you study the dispensationalists, they're careful to say it's a commemorative, not a propitiate, not a propitiatory sacrifice. So I wouldn't, um, as of now, I, I, I don't think there's going to be a return to the Mosaic law because they use the word temple. So I'm assuming that's what they mean there. So, you know, I just point out that the, the, the temple is, is the body of Christ. I I agree with you. I think this is a question that would that would be more in line with the dispensational person. And since you're not that, it's not, it, it really doesn't land uh, in your wheelhouse. And so... Um, yeah, I, I think I think you're you're fine with it being yeah. there or not being there. Yeah, correct. All right, gentlemen, that is about thirty minutes of questions. I appreciate the fast-paced nature of this Q and A. The entire debate was a good professional war for the millennium, and as you both said, largely an in-house war, though. So, oh, Lucas yeah. and Keith. You both gave us a debate to remember. That's for sure. I've been excited for this, and you didn't let me down. So, thank you for that, gentlemen. If we could. Let's get some quick final words, final thoughts. Again, I did want to thank you both. I know how busy you both are, Lucas and Keith, my brothers, and so I appreciate you offering not only the time for the debate itself, but the time that is required for prep leading up to the debate. So, Lucas, let's start with you again. Thank you so much for doing this. And final words, final thoughts. Well, I just want to say on mills, I really respect them because it's hard to debate post mills for some reason. And you would think it'd be the opposite. I noticed that on mills are more willing to talk about this and I really respect them for that. And they have a lot of good arguments. And again, I really respect them for that. So I don't think that there are these people who are just trying to uh, do uh, what is it, eisegesis with the text or anything. So, you know, I, I have uh, tons of respect for them and they actually try to deal with the context and struggle with the text. And I, and I really appreciate Keith for showing up and doing this and being a good example and a good, uh, you know, character or showing good character of all millennials out there. So, you know, I appreciate you and your faithfulness and your ability to challenge me and articulate your positions. And, you know, I love the work that you're doing for Christ. Thank you, Keith. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you for doing this as well. Well, thank you, Donnie, for putting it together. And, and Lucas, I, I do want to say from the, the bottom of my heart, I really appreciate you uh, reaching out, doing this. Um, and, uh, obviously you put a lot of work into this and I super appreciate the, the, the conscientious, uh, 
nature that you took in, in putting all this together. And I will say this. I, I, I said it in the debate, but I want to restate it. I did say this should be the topic of the debate, which is the chronology. And um, I think that uh, in my in my heart of hearts, I thought that it, it, we might go a different direction. So I feel like that maybe at certain points we diverged a little bit from the original um, conversation. And, it, and in doing so, I in no way intended to be unfair or try to hit you from the left field. I was I'm just making arguments that I thought were relevant. But I do want to say you've been very professional very fun to work with. Uh, I love the the fact that we were able to put together that really cool thumbnail with our, us as, you know, uh, characters from uh, Lord of the Rings or whatever it is. Uh, you know, uh, you, you look like a great knight and I look like a hobbit, but it, <laughs> or a, a Viking. You're a Viking king. Yeah. But, but I, I really have appreciated you in this. And I think you gave me a lot of things to think about. And I mean that, uh, uh, you know, and, and I appreciate your, your faithfulness to the text, even though you're a Methodist. No, I'm just <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Keith. Let's no, do round I, two on, on another topic. Yeah, I would love to do it again. I think uh, it was a lot of fun. Yeah. Well, we'll have to get the War for the Millennium Trilogy, much like we have the War yeah. for the One Ring Trilogy. Yeah. So Lucas and uh, Keith, again, great sports, very professional, both very knowledgeable, clearly, on this topic. So I do truly believe this is one of those go-to debates on the Millennium that people can analyze and come to hopefully an objective conclusion on whether or not premillennialism or amillennialism is biblical. So with that, Lucas and Keith, my brothers, God bless the two of you. I appreciate you guys doing this and please enjoy the rest of your weekend. I'm going to let you guys get out of here. Lucas, God bless. Keith, God bless. And okay. to fight with the bible in one hand a joke in the other keeps the king like no other in debates he stands so tall quick with a laugh he conquers all from theology to tales so grand he's the ruler